What's going on, guys? Good morning. Uh, so we're live on uh, Mariah Live. Obviously, you're watching it on the screen there. Um, as I was saying, I'm really happy that I made it this morning. So I didn't set my alarm last night. I just passed out. Uh, I got home on, on Thursday morning from driving back from New York, and we arrived at 6 a.m., did a morning overnight to morning to get home. And I've been sort of struggling with that whole sleep thing since then. So last night I went to sleep and I woke up at 5.15 this morning and I was like, well, that is so good that that happened. Because <laughs> I looked at my clock and I was like, holy smokes, time to go. Um, but I don't know if I was more nervous for the critique or for this. Uh, because Lee said, we want to do something different with the demo. And I said, well, if you want to do something different with the demo, allow the demonstrator to bring one of their own trees and take it home instead of provide it for a raffle. Because it allows us to dive pretty deep into a way more advanced piece of material. And this is a very, very significant Sierra Juniper. So I'm going to rotate this. And if I'm just being honest with you, I haven't spent a lot of time with this tree. Uh, it had a container that came up to here. I've never actually seen it cut down. Troy cut it down yesterday. So this is the first time that I've seen it, and I'm seeing it with you guys. Um, but when we talk about being able to demonstrate, you know, I think demonstrations are extremely valuable. There's a kind of a big movement that say demonstrations are not how bonsai is practiced. And I don't know. I think it depends on the demonstrator. Because from the perspective that I have, I'm not going to do anything on this tree today that I wouldn't do in my own workshop. And I'm not going to do anything on this tree today at a pace that I wouldn't perform in my own workshop. This actually feels very representative. And it also, one of the biggest parts about bonsai in terms of value is inspiration. So to be able to do this in front of you guys and for you guys to watch the process, also watch the, the, the confluence of ideas, um, I think demonstrations are incredibly valuable. How many people have worked Sierra Junipers? You ever worked a Sierra Juniper? Howard, you're the only one. Either everybody else is asleep or you haven't worked a Sierra. I guess I'll take it as you haven't worked a Sierra. OK. Um, Sierra Junipers, high alpine, massive, strong juniper, okay? And so very vigorous, but also very flexible. And this gives us a lot of capacity to manipulate them as bonsai. Incredible piece of material here collected by Randy Knight. Massive. Now, when I start to dig into a piece of material like this, and, and we're sort of assessing this for all of, the, all of the potential things that it could be, Sierra junipers in general don't have the same kind of sap recession and loss of live vein that a lot of our other junipers have, which is why I don't feel as compelled to have all of the deadwood work done first. I will come back and do this over the course of the next week or so just to be able to maximize and finish off this design. But we first, when we start to look at this, need to do that objective analysis of the material. Okay, So I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to kind of rotate this and really think about, think, think hard about, how do we want to handle this piece of material? Where is our best front? And we went through this in the workshop yesterday. But I'm going to go through it with you guys, because this is consistent as far as maximizing the quality of the tree that we're working with to be able to objectively assess its merits and all of its qualities. Okay? Now you can see, just as I pull away a lot of that soil, that we're getting a lot of interest right here, this rolling, contorted uh, live vein across the front of the tree. We've got this big, massive base. We also have a live vein right here that runs up the edge of this and connects to this outer piece. Okay? Now, ultimately, when I start to look at this, this outer piece has a lot of charm and a lot of value and a lot of quality to it. Okay? Let's make sure that we don't get too emotionally attached, though. Let's be very objective. Now, from the back side, Big, broad, very characteristic of Sierra Juniper in terms of a lot of times they get stuck in these pockets in the rock, soil, seedling germinates, and that's the limitation. It takes on the contour of that crack, which is why when we look here, it's very narrow here, it's very broad here, but we see that real strong vigor, that real aggression, that, that durability that Sierra Junipers are pretty characteristically known for, and we also see the impact of snow in terms of how the deadwood is broken, crushed, as well as how the deadwood is hollow. So we start to see these pits and these valleys. You don't see this in desert junipers. They don't have that kind of moisture, but also desert junipers have a lot more resin that they pump into the core of the tree, which preserves them from rotting from the inside out. Alpine species, when we look at elongating species, but also when we look at Sierra juniper as an alpine species, rots from the inside out, not the outside in. Okay, so this is a different nuance that allows us to sort of tap into number one technique, and number two, how we would go about if we were going to alter and manipulate the deadwood, how we would go about doing that while still maintaining the integrity of the, of the characteristics, the environment, and the nuances of the species. Okay? So I'm going to say that our front 
It would be pretty hard to argue with our front being somewhere over here. We all are in agreement there, yeah? Okay, but we've got to start to decide how important is this piece? How much are these pieces holding us back from getting into those pieces? Is there an angle that better shows? And I'm just going to trim this down a little bit more so that you guys can see this because you're down below me. See if we can avoid band-aids today. No, no promises. better? See better now? <sighs> hey. So I'm going to say, just looking at things, okay? Definitely need to be justifications for changing the angle of a tree. When I look at this, it's not bad as it exists now. This starts to form one of the higher points on the tree, and it's definitively holding us back from getting into the interior of the tree. Now with junipers, we've always got to be weighing out how much, is, how much value does this live vein have, right? So when we talk about junipers, where is the inherent aesthetic value in junipers? Contrast between live and dead, the interaction of the living and the dead, right? So when we see this coming over this, we've got this deadwood interacting here. If we take all of this off, we take all of this off and you get into the interior of the tree and you're like, okay, cool, now I can see the rest of the tree and we've solved all of those situations. Yes, but we've really taken away from that interaction. And what we would be left with if we eliminated this, it would be great deadwood, don't get me wrong, it'd be amazing deadwood. I think there's a large percentage of people that would probably choose to eliminate this, right? But what we would be left with is we'd be left with a shard of living tissue shown here, okay? And we'd also be left with a shard of living tissue shown here. So you'd have living tissue on both sides of the trunk and this big mass of white across the front of the trunk. And when we talk about interaction, we're talking about the live vein moving across the deadwood. The more that those interact together, the higher the value of the final product. So when you get this kind of movement, we've got to value that kind of movement. And this has to play into our design concept for junipers. Okay? So if I want to maintain this and I want to be sure to allow you guys access into the rest of the tree, I'm going to have to bring this towards you. But this is a fine balance when we're dealing with material of this quality. Because as I bring this towards you, I'm also going to be starting to lose some of this. I don't want to lose this. I don't want this to become my new soil line here. I want to keep what's in here. So this is going to be a nuanced, we're going to flirt with this. We're going to sort of play with it. We're going to ask it to be nice. And we're going to see if we can get this to a point. Getting this in the truck this morning was awesome at 5 o'clock. It was special. Does that make it better? Can you even tell that, can you even tell that I changed the angle? <laughs> a little bit. Let's see what happens. Better? We losing anything yet? Not yet. Man, that feels really awesome. That's better. Noticeable? Yeah? You feel good about that? Whew. Okay, and then we've got to look at this and we've got to start to say, is there any reason to push it farther this way? Not really, is there? Not really any reason. What do you think, Ira? No? Yeah? Kendall? Your mic's off. If you ever want to ask a question or say anything, I can run over with the mic. So. Kendall, what do you think? Go that way? Yay, nay. Yes. You think so? Yeah. Kim says no. Who says no? Sam says no? I say no because of the deadwood coming up that way. If you tipped it a little more, it would become a little too vertical. Right here. Too vertical. And there's another thing that would happen if we go that way. Notice 
how this is just past horizontal right here. So that live vein that we're talking about, that interaction, that live vein that we're putting a lot of value on. If we take it and we take that live vein that's just past horizontal and we make it horizontal, now we've created a parallel line. We talk about parallel line to what? Parallel line to the eventual container, parallel line to whatever surface this tree sits on. We create a pattern. Can right? we uh, I, see that in the detail cam? Huh? Yeah. OK, so we're just past, just past. Parallel would be right about here. So we're just past. And it's interesting. We talked about this in the workshop yesterday. Those nuances of parallel and perpendicular, within degrees, our eye naturally taps into. Because our eye, there's a lot of visual information to take in in this tree, like a ton of visual information to take into this tree. There's a lot going on here. And we're sitting here looking at it, and we're like, whoa. It's almost overwhelming. And when we start to, when our eye starts to identify patterns, this is how the human brain works with in terms of efficiency. If I don't have to invest all of my energy in understanding this and I get this pattern, I'm going to focus on that pattern. It becomes easy. We're already programmed to do that. So in bonsai, when we're creating an organic form and we want to drive people's attention to the totality of the tree, creating those patterns actually defeats the ability to be able to see the entire tree. This is a major aspect of design when it refers to the organic form, OK? So I want to avoid creating that parallel line. As far as tipping it, now I could come back this way. Would there be any justification to come back this way? Any? OK, so would I ever want to bring the tree back up? No? You guys need more coffee? Something, 8 a.m. was a little rough for all of us. I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no. But in saying no, you guys have to understand why. OK, again, this goes back into, and when we get to a piece of material like this where we've got so much visual information and so much quality, any selection that we make, this is going to be a powerful tree. This is going to be an amazing tree. Anything we cut off of this tree, is still, it's still going to be of quality. It's still going to be amazing because the material is so good, right? But when we talk about taking material of this level and really making it the best it can be, we still have to dig in. We still have to dig in and make uh, intelligent design decisions. So here's where we're at. We've got this living vein anchoring the left side of this tree. This is the most important piece of this composition. Not because I'm saying with junipers the living vein is the most important piece, but because I'm saying in this tree with this movement to the right, the fact that the living vein extends across the tree, interacts with the deadwood, cool. But the fact that the living vein anchors on the left means I can push that far degree of asymmetry. Now I'm going to come back to one of the original things that we talked about. This branch right here, this branch that extends nice, thin, snaking live vein on this massive fin and this wing of deadwood that's been crushed and broken and yet still continues to survive. This is a major, major quality and feature of the tree. The only way that I can use this branch is to have this live vein anchoring that far degree of asymmetry that's pushing to the right. Okay? If I don't have this, if I didn't have this visual anchor, I would have to bring that mass back up so that I can counter all of that weight moving to the right. Okay, so this enables a far degree of push of asymmetry. And when we're designing bonsai, we've got to be thinking about what information allows us to make those asymmetrical decisions. What information about the material allows us to push the degree of asymmetry? When we push the degree of asymmetry, we start to touch more on natural. We start to touch more on environment. We start to touch more on challenging the viewer to really engage with the design of our tree. We can turn this tree very easily into a bonsai proportion, and it would be amazing because of the strength of the material. But the strength of the design needs to be equivalent to the strength of the, of the material to really generate something special. Okay? And so when we start to work with special material like this and we get into the design level of making these considerations, we've got to be thinking on that higher plateau of design concepts, where our design concepts are in line with the quality of the material, and the final product is going to be something that we've never seen before or didn't even imagine could possibly be created. Okay, So we're going to go ahead and we're going to leave it here. We've gained access into the interior of the tree. We're going to have to come up with creative solutions in this region to be able to allow access to all the detail there. But we know that this area right here, extremely important because it enables every single piece of asymmetry to be pursued in the rest of the design. We good? OK. So first things first, I'm going to go about eliminating a lot of this garbage sort of cleaning. This is my. Uh, 
This is my bonsai dating process. Bonsai dating. Ha, who is this guy? If you guys have questions, Kendall's got a mic. This demonstration is probably going to be a little bit different than what you guys have seen before. Has anybody ever been to Europe, seen any demonstrations in Europe? They have a totally different way of demonstrating. Everybody kind of packs into this big arena. At, um, trophy, the trophy in Belgium is probably your biggest European exhibition after the Ginkgo Awards stopped. Everybody packs into this literally like a theater. All of the demonstrators get on stage. The room fills up, a standing room only. There's probably, I don't know, five, 600 people in this room. Everybody kind of starts. They do a brief overview of the work. They start, and everybody leaves. They just literally, everybody's like, cool, got it? And then you do work for like three, four hours, and then everybody comes back. And it fills back up at the end of it, and then you explain your work, and everybody cheers and, and claps, and then they take pictures, and then they leave. Really interesting, <laughs> interesting experience is different than in the United States where we sit through the duration of that. But if you guys really want to watch the process, the one reason that I chose this piece of material, trust me, this is going to be a massive challenge today to be able to do this and do this well. But that kind of challenge, that's really, if you're talking about demonstrations being of value, working on a really humble piece of material, there's always value in that. It's a great exercise in design. It's a great exercise in how we take material that's widely available. But, but some of the most inspirational things, if we're talking about the value of demonstration being showing that higher level or inspiring sort of how we handle this kind of quality of material, then being able to work on this kind of quality material in a demonstration is, is, is something that we don't often see in the United States. And that's really where I wanted to be today. So falling on the grenade for you guys today. But in all actuality, it's, it's, a, it's a really it's a good excuse for me to get to work on this tree if you want to know the honest truth. <laughs> okay, so as I'm kind of teasing through all of this stuff, I'm cleaning up crotches, I'm cleaning out dead stuff. I want to be careful of a lot of these details. Okay, we'll come back and we'll manicure these details, but also these details have to be balanced in terms of what we maintain, to not be overwhelming in terms of the, the small stuff that's showing a lot of youth in terms of this. This is an old tree. A lot of this over the course of time, when we look at the older deadwood, notice how little detail is here. Notice how significant the detail is here. Most of this is gonna be broke off over the course of time. It's gonna deteriorate very quickly. So as we work through this, we're gonna have to sort of break this down to the most nuanced sort of aged bones of the tree. And that's not necessarily a convention, right? Because you could also say, well, in the natural form, some of this died yesterday, some of this died five days ago, some of it died five years ago, some of it died 500 years ago. So you can also explore context in terms of how does that deadwood reflect that moment? How does the deadwood reflect that theme? How does the deadwood reflect the age of that tree? And there's no right answer to that. We're always looking for sort of that guidance. What is right? What is wrong? How do I do deadwood? How should I not do deadwood? But the, the deeper we go into Boneside, the more we recognize, oh, shoot, there's nobody that can actually tell me that. There's a lot of people that can sort of regurgitate what they know or pass on their opinion, but there is no right answer in terms of how we handle that. So we'll see. We'll kind of decide as we move through this how we're going to handle this. The cleanup process for this, though, starts to convey a lot. So I'm getting rid of a lot of these small, spindly pieces up in these big knots of foliage. And we're starting to get a lot more clarity in terms of how do we, or what do we, have to work with in terms of this tree. And the more that we go through this cleaning process, the more we're going to understand how much we have to work with. You guys have any questions? Doing okay? Okay, check that out. So much more clarity, yeah? Better.
Now, when we talk about the vigor of Sierra junipers, you guys see all of these buds that are occurring in here? I mean, it's like, it's literally, it's crazy. Are you getting that, Eve? If you graft on a Sierra juniper, say, for example, we put uh, Itoyagawa, we put Kishu on a Sierra juniper, and that, that graft takes and you cut off all the Sierra juniper foliage. Sierra juniper will actually produce foliage at the base of that branch that you grafted on. So you're constantly removing Sierra juniper foliage once you graft, graft them over. And this is very nuanced because, say, for example, we put black pine on a ponderosa. You put black pine on a ponderosa, you cut off all the ponderosa needles, you're never going to get, you'll always have black pine. It's never going to produce buds on the interior of ponderosa pine. You've forever transitioned it over. The Sierra juniper will always continue to produce Sierra foliage. So it just means that you can always go back if you decide later that that was a mistake. You bet. Cool. So as I'm kind of cleaning here, I want you guys to follow the same process that I'm following in terms of you're also getting to know the tree. You're seeing things out there. When, we, when it comes down to making significant branch elimination decisions, I'm going to lean on you guys to be helping me in the, in the shaping decisions of this tree. And I expect you guys to be doing your homework so that we're able to come up with the best design for this. Got it? You all know your assignment? Joe? I'm serious now. What's that? Somebody. So when I'm in these big kind of piles of foliage and when you guys start to clean out your trees, right? Always leave yourself the ability to utilize some of this stuff. So you can see on the detail cam how there's these pieces that are originating from the interior. And you start to say, okay, well, if I'm going to leave some of this stuff, what stuff do I leave? How do I know, how do I know that I leave it? So we've got this really small really small, nuanced, detailed stuff. That's never going to become, at least not for a significant period of time, something that you can utilize in the design. But then we've got these bigger pieces. We've got these more established, lignified pieces. These are definitely capable of contributing immediately, and they're also capable, because of their strength and their sort of development of that woody tissue, excuse me, very capable of becoming branches in the immediate design and branches in the overall tree. In a much shorter period of time, they've already built that vascular system that we need in terms of being able to contribute. So if we go with that really sort of small, fresh, almost like water sprout type adventitious bud on the interior, some of these smaller pieces right here. Okay, this over the course of five to 10 years will become usable. But yet when we start to talk about some of these pieces that are engaging from the same junction as this big major branch, at some point, this big major branch is going to be so big, it's no longer usable. So we can start to work with some of this finer stuff right here to replace this over the course of time. And this is the perpetuation of bonsai in the coniferous model, right? A lot of times when we're talking about this evolution over the course of time, one of the consistent thematics that you hear repeated is, I need more back budding, I need more back budding, I need more back budding. And then we think, much like a deciduous tree, we're going to prune the whole tree back to all of those back buds, and that's how we're going to reduce it, and that's going to give us a really high-level bone size. But that's a, that's a deciduous model. Okay? So with conifers, it's this constant, consistent cultivation of those interior pieces. And when this gets too big and this starts to take over, 
Then we remove this and we replace it with this, and we may do that in one location in that working, we may do that in several locations in that working, but we're always adjusting, always managing, always replacing, and always refining. And this is where we have to make the shift from conifer to deciduous in terms of that mentality. Because a deciduous, we could cut this back to bare wood at the appropriate time of year, it'll produce buds and we start regrowing branches. But conifers don't behave like that, and that is a misunderstanding in terms of our approach that has led to a lot of devastating decisions being made on a lot of our junipers over the, over the sort of course of North America and over the course of, of bonsai in the United States that we've got to make an adjustment to and start to really understand that slower, long-term creation of those interior pieces and knowledge of that expansion, because this is only going to get bigger. It's not going to get smaller, okay? So we've got to be building the pieces to be able to control the size of this tree that gives the proportion to the design that we're striving for. Looks pretty crazy when it gets all cleaned up, doesn't it? Lime, can I get, oh, I'm live, cool. <laughs> Check, you've got a question for you, right? Hey Ryan, oh, yeah. with a tree like of, of this uh, stature, is it, is it possible to have too much dead wood? Yeah, yeah, and that's where I think, you know, when we take this bigger idea of a tree and we start to miniaturize it and we compress it into this much smaller, smaller space, we've got to really sort of rein in that abstraction of that quantity of deadwood. Because you could go into the mountains and you can say, well, it has, it has all of this fine branching, it has all this fine deadwood. I want to carry that into this tree. But when you condense the space that all that fine branching exists in, you start to lose the representation of scale because you're literally dealing with the same size branch that's forming a lot of that deadwood in the natural environment. And so that's where you're seeing me really simplify all of those spiky things that are occurring on these pieces of deadwood. I'm taking them back to really the bones of the deadwood so that I have the remnant, I have the age, but also so that I decrease all of that visual sort of content in these spaces. As far as can you have too much deadwood in terms of the trunk and the living veins, this is subjective. This is subjective because if you asked Mr. Kimura, he would say no. Right? The smaller the living vein, the greater the portion of deadwood, the more dramatic the composition. Okay? And if you look at the oldest trees in the natural environment, really, really old trees have a very small live vein and a very significant amount of deadwood. When we start to look at what does that mean in terms of sustainability and health as a bonsai? Well, one small borer getting into that one small vein means a very big dead tree. So there, is, there are some questions about longevity and sustainability. One of the other questions is, can a tree sustain itself just physically in terms of movement of resources on a very small live vein? That is not an issue because a tree doesn't have a credit card. So it can't be creating foliar mass and it can't be creating vascular tissue that it can't maintain on its current structure. It'll always be scaling that live vein to what, it has the, what the live vein has the capacity to do. And so when we deal with older trees and smaller live veins, if they're functioning more slowly, it's because the live vein can only do that much, right? And sometimes with bonsai, we try, we think, it's not growing the same as all of my other trees. So I need to do, I need to feed more, I need to, I need to make this as aggressive as my other trees. But one thing that we're dealing with in North America that we've got to be very aware of is we are dealing with trees of an age that not many countries in the world are dealing with. There's an exception and an understanding of the fact that because that age exists and because that tissue is only so big, there's only so much that tree can do, we've got to adapt our, our expectations of that piece of material. But visually, if you're asking me, Lyle, I'm going to say that it's very hard to have too much deadwood if what you're striving to achieve in your compositions is dramatic. I'm going to say it's very easy to have too much deadwood if you're trying to um, touch on other subjects with your work. And I think that's where the material, you know, we talk about bonsai as a collaborative relationship between the, the artist and the tree. That's where the material starts to really drive that dialogue. And I think one thing that we're starting to recognize and hopefully improve upon is letting the material make more of the decisions and applying less, less of our sort of bias to that material. 
that also is changing the shape, it's changing the design, it's changing the approach, and I think this is actually bonsai on that higher level. You guys developing any ideas for what we're going to do with this? Doing your homework? No? Yeah? Is this intimidating tree to you guys? It's intimidating to me, so if you're not intimidated, I would say it's just because you don't know. Crazy, crazy. I've never worked on a Sierra Juniper of this caliber. This is this is the Sierra Juniper of a new of a new level. Hundreds of hun, hun, right here. Does anybody know the oldest juniper species in the United States? Anyone? Oldest juniper species in the United States. Anyone? The Sierra juniper. That was a loaded question. Loaded question. Big time loaded question. They, they don't know. They guesstimated at uh, over 3,000 years old, but here's the thing. Do you remember what I uh, said to you guys about the, the tendency of Sierra juniper? rots from the inside out. So how would you ever be able to know the appropriate age of it if the core is rotting? Okay, and this is also why we don't know what the oldest ponderosa pine in the United States is. Because after 800 years of age, ponderosa pine starts to rot from the core as well. So they've calculated ponderosa pine up to 800 years old, and then you get all of these ponderosa pine that you core sample, and the, and the core of the tree is rotted out. So, so the, the central record of its formative years as a young tree are gone. So do ponderosa pine live to 2,000 years old? Do they, do they have a natural lifespan of 1,000 years old? Do they have a natural lifespan of 5,000? Nobody knows. Doubtful that they would usurp the bristle cones because the bristle cones have very special characteristics that make them so long lived. Do you guys know what that is? I'm going to contribute to your botanical jeopardy knowledge today. All of, all of the stuff you don't really need to know to do bonsai well, but it's interesting if you really like bonsai. <clears throat> Does anybody experience borers in their bonsai? Yeah, yeah, it sucks, right? So they're saying that, you know, the borers killed off 95% of the lodgepole pine on the Continental Divide in Colorado. Anybody driven through? the Rocky Mountains lately, a lot of dead trees, right? So they're saying that they're moving into the limber pine right now. That and, uh, and uh, I think it's called white pine gall, or, or uh, excuse me, white pine blister gall or blister rust or something like that. There's a major pathogen that's moving through the limber pine. The limber pine are our second, second oldest living species in terms of uh, pines in the world to bristle cones. Anyways. A lot of people have asked, are the bristle cones going to succumb to this? And they say, well, bristle cones are actually resistant to borers because of the tannins that they produce in their wood. A, a borer can't digest this. This is very similar to a redwood. There's a reason that redwood have become the tallest tree in the world, and that's because once they inject all that sap into the core, it's no longer something that the insects can feed on. They can't digest it. Termites can't digest it. Borers can't digest it. it makes them immune. A lot of the longest-lived trees have these Immune, immune immunities created by the resin that's produced through photosynthesis and through their foyer mass. And that resin is injected into the core so that it creates structural stability, it doesn't rot, etc. It's really interesting. Why do I talk to you guys about this? Why should you care? Why should you care as bonsai practitioners? And it's not about like... A, this isn't about like a, a sustainability, why should you care? There's more to it than that. Why should you care?
you don't care. Is what you are like, oh, we we just we just we just really don't care. No, just kidding. Uh, here's why. When we start to look at how many bone side bristlecone pines have you guys seen? None? One? If you watch Mirai Live, right? How many uh, bone side limber pines have you seen? A few? Handful? Maybe? How many bone side Sierra junipers have you seen? A dozen? Less? Right? So we're talking about and we're working with all of these native species because importation is no longer possible, or at least not possible on a commercial level in the United States. And we're working with all of these collected species because we've got collectors that do it well, that collect successfully. And then we're saying, all right, so how do I know what to do? How do I know what to do? It's a good question. How do you, how do you learn what to do? How do you know what to do? Where does that information come from? No. Comes from all of that. Comes from all of those little tidbits of horticultural knowledge, physiological knowledge, biological knowledge about these species. Oh. Resistant to borers, that sap. What does that sap do? How does that impact aesthetic? What does that sap do in terms of strength? I'm going to say, for a long time, we've considered Japanese black pine to be the strongest pine that we can utilize. We recognize that ponderosa pine has a similar strength in the root structure. What about bristlecone pine? Is it possible that bristlecone pine might not be the strongest pine that exists in the world, that that would allow us to manipulate it in different ways? because of this resin store that makes it unfeedable on insects, preserves it from disease and, and all of the things, allows it to be the longest living tree in the world? I think so. You know, but we start to look at these mechanisms and we start to see it dictates aesthetic, it dictates our approach. It starts to really form and create some of that criteria that nobody can hand us because we, we haven't been doing bonsai in the United States with our native species for several hundred years like they have in Japan. We haven't teased out that knowledge and we haven't had those serendipitous experiences that allow us to really know what's possible. Okay, we're starting to get to our, our first kind of major design decision and that is what happens in here. Okay, I'm gonna clean up the base of this area and I want you guys to be able to tell me, do we use them? Do we use both of them? We, we know that we use them because this is important. Do we use both of them? If not, why? If so, why? As soon as you guys have your opinion formed, I wanna know about it. Because if I don't need to be cleaning them, then that'll save me a lot of time. Yeah, let me rotate over here so you guys can see. Do we use both of these pieces? Do we use this stuff here? Do we take some of them off? That's what I'm asking. Oh, I'm trying. Oh, there it is. Be careful then. This, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. this is a tree that already is fairly flat in the base because it was living in a crevice. Um, I keep thinking that you wouldn't want to lose too many branches that continue to give it a three-dimensional. Right. You know, it's very tempting to get rid of these front branches, but then you'd end up with a, a flat tree. Right, right. So you think we use all of them then? No, not necessarily, but I... My mind was already jumping to things. You've got three top branches that are kind of in a plane. Right. And then you've got some in the front. Right. Um, you, you might want to get rid of some in the front, but you don't want to overtake that in proportion to the back. Branch. Don't overreduce is what you're saying. I, I, I agree with that. I think that's a really intelligent observation. So, so if, if I'm not going to keep all of them, but we recognize that I've got to keep some of them, which ones do I keep and how do you form that opinion? question here as well. Hi, Ryan. Hi. Um, I was wondering how hollow that tree is on the inside since you're up there. Yeah, it looks to me like it's still pretty stable, probably not super hollow, but we would have a hard time knowing until we get really get into it. And I'm guessing the core is definitively hollow. So it hasn't expanded outwards very much. But if I put a chainsaw into this deadwood, <laughs> 
which I would never do. But if I put a chainsaw into this deadwood, we would definitely hit open space, right? And that's, that's become really, when you get to the older Sierra junipers, you can predict that that is gonna be the case, that that interior core is gonna be hollow, particularly on a level of material this, this significant and this old, we're gonna be seeing a lot of negative space on the interior. It hasn't expanded outwards very much though. So this is still very solid. And you can hear it when you, yeah. when you tap on it, it's still very dense and very solid. So how hollow, not, not a lot yet. Okay, design-wise, I'm thinking that the, the far right branch in the front could, could become dead wood. This so one? That it would open up, yeah, so that you could get the contrast of the vein through the middle and then open up the, the large branch that comes out the back that's dead wood. This piece right here. We've got to get to that piece, don't we? Which one of these branches on the front is most important? Let me ask you guys that. There's a bonsai, there's a bonsai concept to this. There's also a design concept to this because the most important branch is the most poorly placed branch. Which, one's the, which, which one is the most important branch from this perspective and the worst placed branch from a design perspective? Which one? Hard to see the branches. You get this one? This is the worst branch on the tree, right? It's the most important branch on the tree. Why is it the most important branch on the tree? It's the worst and it's the most important. How can that be? It's, it's attached to the highest, the highest live vein, right? So the more that we reduce this, the more the live vein shifts to the front and we start to lose this exterior anchor. Right? And we're talking about this exterior anchor gives us the ability to use that branch over there. Right? And this is, this is where I, th I think we tend to think about boneside design as, as selective. Ah, I want to do this. I think this would look cool. This seems like a good design. This seems like a good idea. And this is where I want to really push back. I want to push back on that thought process because I think boneside design is actually educated. It's educated decisions. If this is so important to be able to utilize that, and that's what gives us the ability to create that really far degree of design and that far reflection of old, then all of a sudden we've got to be creative about how to use this or else we're going to lose this, and that means we can't use that. Okay? Now, I could always use that while eliminating this, but then when we look at it, all of a sudden this fantastic piece of material that enabled a lot of that disappears. So this is where we start to work. Now, I'm going to have to keep this, and because I'm going to keep this, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to eliminate this. Okay. So now when we start to talk about how do you decide which branches you keep and which branches you eliminate, it's not me being like, I like this branch, I don't like this branch. It's like, okay, I have this live vein which attaches to this, which allows me to use that, and that means this branch that's clogging up that space, I can't have that anymore. And bonsai starts to become very, very effortless, starts to become easy, because the tree is what's dictating the design decisions. Does that make sense? Is that how you guys do it? I'm going to give you guys another idea to grab onto for just a minute. Do you think that the value of bonsai is in the final product or the process? Depends on who. So where is the value of bonsai for you guys? Is it in the, is it in the final product or is it in the process? Process, right? What is the thing, when we talk about bonsai expanding as an art form, what is the thing that people who have no clue about bonsai see the least of? Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? We talk about, we want to get more people in our club. We want to, we want to elevate, you know, I think about this myself. I, say, I, I want the, the, the level of bonsai in the United States to increase. This was uh, big, big, broad sort of aspiration when I came home from Japan. I want, I want to help, I want to do my part to elevate the level of bonsai in the United States. So 
So I'm going to show a bunch of awesome trees, right? And all of a sudden, after showing a bunch of awesome trees over and over and over again, you start to recognize, ah, it's the final image is cool, but the value of bonsai, the thing that makes it so attractive to people, is actually the process. That's really where bonsai's power exists, right? That change, that constant practice, that necessity for us to be paying attention to our trees. All of a sudden, you start to reconceptualize re your priorities of what it means to elevate the level or what it means to spread the love of the art form. And this is why I think BSOP's been so wildly successful. You know, because you have to, when you look at BSOP being a club that's leading the charge, you've got to kind of, why? Why? Well, one, it's welcoming. You guys are pretty rad. Two, the process has become more of the focus than the product. Right? And it's powerful. So we're streaming you know, nationally, internationally, worldwide right now, and you start to talk about bonsai from that perspective, that process, in my mind, when we start to talk, speak of the expansion of the art form, seems to be some place that we haven't necessarily focused on that could definitively pull more people in if you show them the value of that process. Starting to gain a lot of design clarity in the cleaning process, yeah? You guys haven't figured out yet? Anyone? Anyone? Any design ideas? Got it? If you have ideas, just raise your hand and I'll run over to you with this mic so everybody on the street can hear too. <laughs> so I'm gonna walk you I'm gonna walk you through my process when it's time. I'm going to reason, reason you through my process. How's that? Let's get the interior of this cleaned up. This will help us to see. a thought about this uh, tree that is thousands of years old is that um, when you design a bonsai, you're trying to make it appear old. Ah. And so, for instance, I imagine you're going to be pulling down foliage and making it look a way that I've seen most junipers look after they're being um, done as a bonsai. And the idea being, well, there's going to be snow on the branches and they're going to hang down and everything. And I'm going, yeah, but... This is proof, you know, it, this is what happens after thousands of years. So it's, it's an interesting challenge. The same thing with that deadwood on the left, which I'm always told, well, that kind of deadwood would never survive in, you know, after many years because this and this and this would happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, and obviously you need clarity in the design. Otherwise, what's the point of making it into a bonsai just stick it in a pot? But that whole, just thinking through that concept, is something I keep thinking of. It's such an old tree. Whew. So you're starting. You're starting to. You're starting to touch on a very cerebral conversation. But l let's go ahead and have it. So this is. This is where. Uh, you know. Again, this isn't. This is the, the the purpose of this demonstration is not for me to stand up here and tell stories and entertain. It's to really get to get to see the process of a tree like this because this is not your standard demonstration material, right? But now we start to touch on these questions. Because if we're, if we're approaching this tree in our workshop, we've got to be considering all of those things. And you say, OK, some of this deadwood, some of this real spindly deadwood, this tree is hundreds of years old. I, doubt, I doubt we're touching on 1,000 with this piece of material. But maybe, you never know. So it's hundreds of years old. 
And this tree is proof that this does, in fact, adhere and sort of represent the tree and is a part of a tree that's 100 years old and we're, and we're, or hundreds of years old and we're cutting it all off, right? Or we're decreasing it down to sort of the bulk majority of dead one. This comes back to Lyle's question too. So any time that we enter a tree and we start doing this work, we have to understand what time frame in the development of this tree or its evolution on, that, on this grand scale. Like we as human beings, we're born, we're a baby, go through adolescence, teenage years, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, who knows, right? 90s, maybe 100s, and then we die. And our body has an evolution over that course of time, right? Well, trees have this evolution as well, okay? Now, 100, 200, 500, 800, 1,000, 3,000, their time frame is longer, right? So we would be like, uh, we would be like dog years to trees, bonsai trees, are in dog years to what's happening in the natural environment, right? It's happening much quicker, those transitions, still illustrates the same point. So when we start to design bonsai, we've really got to select where in that, in that sort of span of the tree's life does this piece of material allow us to create that iteration of its, of its design. And this is a really liberating aspect of bonsai because for the longest time, and this is what I, if you guys were in the critique this morning, this is gonna come back to touching on what I talked about in the critique. For the longest time, our vision of what you're supposed to do in bonsai is to create a tree of this form and this proportion to the trunk, and this is bonsai, right? And that's not, that's not, uh, that's not incorrect, that's not untrue. But when we start talking about if, if our iteration, if what we define as bonsai is the Japanese art form, which it is, the word describes the Japanese art form, okay? And we talk about, Penjing describes the Chinese art form. That was the first iteration of where bonsai came from, okay? And this is gonna get pretty, pretty esoteric. Now, if we're starting to say that we're not gonna abide by that form and proportion, one of the things that's been expressed to me in my travels across the world is, you shouldn't call it bonsai anymore. <laughs> well, that starts to be a conundrum, right? But maybe not. Maybe it's, you know, maybe this other iteration, if those cultural implications that make define bonsai uh, aren't being adhered to, then it could be disrespectful, just the same as it changed from penjing to bonsai. Maybe bonsai needs to change to something else, okay? Conversation for another time. Anyways. When we start to get into this though, part of that deviation, when we start working with this kind of material, if bonsai largely has been adhering to that size and proportion, that size and proportion when we look at the natural sort of scale and scope and time frame of trees is largely a teenage representation, okay? It's not necessarily an ancient representation and it's not necessarily accurate. The idea is to make it look old, but old is an arbitrary term. How do you quantify old? Do you quantify old as 50 years? Do you quantify old as 100 years? Do you quantify old as 250 years? And then inside of that, are we understanding what that species over 200 years, 500 years, 800 years, 2,000 years, the shift in the appearance of that tree over that course of time? Okay, because I'm gonna say to date, we haven't necessarily thought about that a whole lot. But if we start to look at bonsai, particularly with our native species, which, Again, why do you need to know about the resin in, in bristlecone pine making them impervious to borers? Because it impacts the techniques that we apply to the tree. Why do we know about, need to know about the vascular structure of a Sierra juniper versus a Rocky Mountain juniper? Why do we need to know that this rots from the core and not from the exterior? Because it impacts how we represent that species in miniature. Okay? These are all of the nuances that are educating our design approach. So when we start to look at this too, why do we need to know what a Sierra Juniper looks like in its younger iteration, middle iteration, older iteration, and truly ancient iteration? Because we're dealing with material that offers the characteristics that allow it to, us to hop into one of those iterations. And if we're doing bonsai really well, representing that iteration of that species in that environment that the characteristics are defining is doing bonsai on that higher level. But it also is a deviation from what bonsai has traditionally been practiced as and now this starts to change the whole game because we lose all of our box and we lose our bumper rails and we lose our guidance and we lose what's good and what's bad as a defined term and we lose what's right and what's wrong and we lose what's correct and what's incorrect. 
And that kind of nebulous, sort of gray, cloudy area where we don't have our footing is uncomfortable to the majority of people. Looks a little bit different now, yeah? You guys remember what it looked like in the beginning? You haven't forgotten, have you? Okay, let's figure this out. Because now, all of a sudden, everything has changed. Okay, we know. Let's talk about what we know. We know that this section of branching right here, the one that's in the very worst spot, okay, I'm going to show this on the detail cam. This section right here that's in the very worst spot, it's hiding all of this beauty in the background. We know that this is the most important because this vein, when we just follow that flow, this vein, and when we start to track this vein, these fractures, see these plates? This is the shedding of the cork cambium, okay? But these, as, this, as this thickens, we've got this production of tissue, and as it thickens, it separates along the linear movement of that vascular resource. So if we track these, we can follow the exact sap flow of all of these veins. So when I look here, this piece that provides this visual anchor, and I follow those lines in the bark, it feeds directly to these two pieces. Now, could I remove this piece, save this piece, and still maintain the quality of that vein? Probably. However, this piece doesn't have a lot of conductive tissue on it. You notice this? It's got this, it's got this, and it's got this. So when I look at that and I start to say, OK, which one of these is the more valuable piece? This clearly is my champion in this area. Cool. If this is the most challenging area and I've got to create space to allow you access into here, and this vein is so important, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take off the least valuable to open up the space in the real estate, knowing that, and again, Stay with me thematically through this demonstration, knowing that this tree allows us to hop into a more older iteration of design, okay? Creating that space is a representation of age and miniature. Negative space and random occurrence of branches, natural representation of a juniper, natural representation of elements that are acting on the tree that are unpredictable, okay? We're the unpredictable element today, all right? Just by creating that piece of space right here, you automatically have access to that. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to strip this down, this interesting branch here. It's going to be a value. Okay. So we know that the Sierra Juniper is crushed and broken, right? Let's see if we can crush and break as much of this as we possibly can. <sighs> Okay, I want to tear, I want to ah, destroy. Okay, and I've got a lot of detail in here. When I see this, though, I want to take away. Notice this straight line in the detail cam. Notice this straight line really hiding you from that. That starts to de decrease the ability for this to hold you out of that. We're automatically creating that space. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to shorten this line. And I've got a beautiful transition to this interesting gin, okay? I'll just break down the tip. I'll have to come back and do a lot of the work on this deadwood and live vein afterwards. But if I break this down, okay, just showing some of that fracture and that snow crush, shorten this from a design perspective, okay, but trying as hard as I can to break and to tear, not to cut. <sighs> And I'm even going to leave that piece. Do we want this bottom portion to die off or not? That's the question. Because if we take this off, and we've already eliminated this, we're going to reduce this, OK? This is going to significantly alter the shape of this. OK, we've got to think about that. Don't do it. Do it. Just lower it. You want to lower it. You want to cut it off. Howard says go. Do it. Do it. I was wondering if you tip the whole thing up where that, that long one was more at a vertical angle, what would be the Tipped it this way? Aesthetic, yeah. Ah, uh, well, but we already talked about if we're going to push that ancient, we're going to use this to anchor that. No, I can't do that. Can't. 
That's but illegal. Lose it. That's illegal. No, I'm just kidding. There's no. <laughs> All right, let's get it on. Let's do it. So it feels like we've already sort of reconciled this area. We've got penetration there. We need to see what this is going to become in terms of the tree. I'm guessing we don't need this long extent. Or do, do we want to? Because we have this really push as far as we possibly can. Push that asymmetry. You want to see what that looks like. It's not going to look like a bonsai today. So do you want to see what that looks like? That's the question. Roger wants to see what it looks like. Some people are going, no, no. Bonsai, bonsai. I, there's no right or wrong, okay? There's no right or wrong. Let's see what it looks like. Let's see what it looks like to truly push. And then if we don't like it, we can always say, oh, we didn't need that anyways. All right, okay? I want to be the biggest piece possible. I can't selectively choose which one that is. I've got to let natural selection dictate that because if I choose this and it gets knocked down, and I choose this and it gets knocked down, and this and it gets knocked down, I've just lost all my energy. So how do I allocate those resources to the most intelligent area? Well, if the hormone that's going to dictate that vertical height is created here, it can hitch a ride on water molecules. Those water molecules are being evapotranspired here. And the place where the most transpiration is taking place, the most sun exposure, the most wind exposure, the branch that's on the exterior and has the best possible chance to be a leader, that's where the most water is going to be lost. Well, guess what? If auxin is produced at the point in the root tip where water comes in, latches onto that water molecule and rides that roller coaster all the way to this, the place where the most water transpires is also the place where the most auxin is deposited. This is a perfect system. This is a perfect system for the natural selection of a leader that's going to give you the most photosynthetic efficient system. That's mind boggling. That is mind boggling. This is perfection in terms of the con conceptualization of a system. Hang on, they're going to give you the mic, Roger. So basically, that's why you're... One, two? Yeah. <laughs> so when you balance energy on the tree by removing foliage, basically that's what you're doing, is reducing the amount of evapotranspiration at that location. This is one. This is one. You're removing the amount of evapotranspiration because not only is auxin hitching a ride on the water molecule, so is nitrogen, so is phosphorus, so is potassium, so is iron, so is cal. All of that is riding the roller coaster of water. Water is driven through this system by just a loss of it through the foyer mass. It's amazing, right? So the place that's growing the most gets the most auxin, gets the most nitrogen, gets because it's photosynthesizing and it's transpiring. So when we start to think about that, when you start in bonsai, we don't want this to get bigger, so we trim this, and these start to grow, and we trim those, and all of these little things start to grow. This is the transition of the strength from a bigger tree to a smaller tree, from the exterior to the interior. And if we understand that, we can do that at a time when this has energy positive, and when we prune it, it responds with good, solid, sustainable growth. So Ryan? Yeah. At times, it feels like you're talking about auxin as a stimulant and sometimes as a suppressant. Does it work both ways? I understand Absolutely. how it's pulled up through the, the water column. You accumulate the most at the tips. Right. So if, that's a, if it's an accelerant or a stimulant, that makes sense. It's going to grow the most. But then, you know, when you remove that, or when we talk about it, removing it, we're talking about removing it like it's a uh, suppressant. Well, so how do you choose to look at it, right? Because is it stimulating this or is it suppressing this? It's, it depends on, how, is gravity, uh, you know, when we start to talk about gravity, is gravity pulling water out of the container or pushing it through the container? You know what I'm saying? So you can think about it in different ways. It's the concept that you have to understand. So science also has this debate. Is auxin a hormone that drives? or is auxin a hormone that suppresses? And there's no real answer to that, right? Because if you take this shoot and you prune this off and you rep replaced it with a cap of, of gelled auxin, these would not grow. But this central stem would continue to elongate. Is it stimulating the central stem to elongate or is it suppressing lateral branch growth behind it? Oh, this is interesting, right? 
Horticulture is awesome. It's blue smoke. Blue smoke. Ooh. How's it looking? Do we like the wildness that's here? This is the question. Are we, are we into it? Are we not? Is it long? Is it pushing our comfort level? Is it pushing our comfort level because it's not what we ex expect? Is it aesthetically starting to dilute the value of the tree? These are all the things we've got to mix into this big cauldron of decision making and bonsai. What do you think? Good? Yeah? Anybody think it's too much? A little long, Ira, a little long, a little long? I'm about the that a little mm, Okay, all right. Cool, let's keep going. I'm going to move to this, and then we've got to get this, this thing here. We've got to wrangle this. And the question is, how, how many people have been to the Mormon Immigrant Trail? How many people have been over Donner Pass? How many people have been into the Sierra Nevadas? Yeah? Have you guys ever seen the big, massive... Sierra junipers, not the upright ones, but the ones that are contorted over the stone. What do they look like to you? They look like a bonsai tree. It's the only species in the world that I know of that when I go to the natural environment and I see ancient, it looks like a bonsai tree. Crazy, right? They're literally giant bonsai. But the thing that they have that bonsai don't have is that abstracted asymmetry, much farther than the bonsai form where they pulled them back. So I want to see if we can touch on that and really carry these in that direction that we start to establish that Sierra Juniper. Okay? So let's go, let's go over here next. Yeah? <laughs> We're good. We're great. Doing great. It's great. It's great. It's really great. It's great. It's great. <clears throat> okay. So we got to have this branch, we got to have this branch engage, right? So there's a discussion of is this too far forward? We got to pull that forward in order for that to be a part of this design. So when we start to look at this, right, this tree has to, even when we're talking about abstractions and we try to manipulate this concept, we still have to adhere to that idea that if the tree is not engaging, if it's not inviting, if it's not welcoming to us as the viewer, it starts, we start to be lost, okay? So if this piece is so important, and I've made a very big deal out of this piece, I now have to use it and tell you guys how important it is and pull it into the design, this really has to come back towards the viewer. It has to engage with us. Now, not all pieces of it. I can use this to create that length that's going to play with this. I can use this to create that depth. But at least some portion of it has got to engage with the front because we can't come any farther or we're going to lose this, right? We're functioning inside of a lot of design ideas at once here. This starts to become a little overwhelming to, to stay inside of this, but if you guys can understand the thought process to apply some of this to your own pieces. For those of you who are just joining, if you have a question, let me know, and we can run the mic over to you. And Ryan... For people who don't know, would you want to talk about Mirai Live and we're streaming live yeah. and all of it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Mid bend. That's good stuff. Mid bend. All right. Ask, question ask. Uh, yeah, I got it. Okay, so if you guys just joined us or if you guys have been here this whole time, basically there's cameras all around. Just to make sure you understand what's going on. So we've got this, um, I'm talking about all these concepts up here. Uh, about horticulture, about design, about know why. We've talked about a lot of design concepts and how we execute them here. This whole sort of idea about bonsai, an idea about how do we elevate the art form and finding the value in that process and being impaired by all of those mysteries of bonsai, the blue smoke of bonsai, 
I started to think about how do you dispel a lot of that? How do you teach this stuff? Do you write a book? Well, things are changing. We, do, we get it wrong on Mariah Live sometimes. Started thinking about physical presence. You're limited, right? And so that's where we saw the ability for technology to really start to contribute to our manner in the way that we can share this knowledge and make a dialogue and create a community that's interested in taking bonsai to that level. So these cameras are actually streaming live to the world right now. If you're at home, you could be watching this. They'll go on the archive of Mirai Live where you can go back and watch it over and over and over again. And we're teaching bonsai to the world via Mirai Live. Live.bonsaimirai.com. Okay, there's memberships. We're getting ready to update the UX system, but it's basically an online educational platform to talk about the nuts and bolts, the techniques, the horticulture, the design, the nuances, explore the environment, explore the species that we utilize. And it has, over the past 18 months, taken over our lives. Yes, 232 a, videos I just checked yesterday. How many? 232. Yeah, <laughs> of me just emptying the nerdy. tank every single Tuesday, live, just like we're doing now, and then creating really well illustrated and orchestrated uh, pre-produced videos to execute technique and to discuss some of the deeper issues that sort of the rambling of the live um, structure doesn't really allow us to do. If you guys haven't checked it out and you're interested in learning bonsai, it is, it is something that I'm very proud of uh, because it's something that I always wanted when I was trying to learn bonsai as a high school kid and a college kid and I couldn't find the information that I wanted. I literally, with the help of this team, with Kendall, um, Jesus, Josh, Sam, Ryan, and now Eve, um, and my main man, Troy, which takes care of the garden while we're playing with technology, and Colton, which manages all the funds that keeps this happening, uh, we've been able to, to bring this to life. And uh, it's really exciting because still, as I'm standing up here, wiring this tree and I'm thinking about all the things I need to say and touch on while I'm trying to demonstrate and execute radical techniques. <clears throat> I'm just a bonsai junkie at heart. Like full on, if you gave me a choice of what I would be doing on a daily basis, what I would be doing with my free time or my finances if I had another career, it would be this. This is what I would be doing. Uh, and so it becomes very easy to be passionate about sharing this with you guys because I get to do this on a daily basis. I just have a little bit more insight into all of this stuff and I tend to think about it a lot more because it's my career now. So I get to share that with you guys. Anyways, if you're interested, check it out. Um, I'd encourage all of you guys to take a look at it. Maybe for you, may not, doesn't matter, but at least you've seen it. All right, let's get this. Let's get this very precarious branch out of the way. Okay, so I'm going to be pulling this with guy wire because there's no way four gauge is going to allow me to accomplish what I want to accomplish. Now, let's just keep in mind our goals. I don't want to cover this. I do want to expose this. And somehow this needs to look like a Sierra Juniper branch that moved in that direction when it's done. These are our sort of design constrictions for this application of technique. So when I look at this, I'm thinking about, okay, four gauge isn't gonna move this, four gauge is gonna move this, right? So I'm gonna use a guy wire to get this down, but I don't wanna cover it. How far down do I go? What do I do with this when I get that down to where I want it to be? These are all the questions that before I ever execute this technique, I've gotta understand the answer to. So that's, uh, Basically, you guys assuming that I know what's going to happen. But I, I'm still not totally sure. Going with the flow, just flowing. What would you guys do with this branch? Once I bend it down, it's going to be upside down in a horrific position. What would you guys do with it? You want to see it first? <laughs> All right, here we go.
Did we go too far? We still got all of the things we need? Did we go far enough? Yeah, so-so, kind of. Mm. Let's see what we're going to do with this before we go any farther. How about that? This is going to have a large impact. Remember how I said Sierra Juniper are really flexible? So that was over there, right? This is what snow load and that adaptability allows you to do. So now that we've brought that back, can we go a little bit farther? You think? You think? Or are we going to cover up some of that farther? A little bit? A little bit? OK, we'll go slow, just for you guys at home. I don't want to cover that up, but we're getting pretty close. Maybe we're going to have to split the difference. Let's go a little bit farther, just a little bit. OK. That'll do, yeah? Cool. And I'm not super interested in this being really dominant coming back this way. I'm just going to shorten this. Did that open up this? We get into that now? A little bit? Not a whole lot? Do we need to go shorter? Let's go shorter and lower. And let's go more to the front. And I think we can go a little bit lower. We're just going to massage this now. Hey, Ryan. Yeah. Hey, Ryan. Yeah. Would you bring that branch in closer? To the center and then pull it back out at all? In this way? So I would, except for I've got a lot of valuable pieces here that if I don't keep them, I'm not going to have near the foliage mass on the apex I need. So I'm kind of trying to balance that. Now in the future, do we try to pull it in as some of those are shed and this expands? Yes. Right? So first iteration, maybe not. Second iteration, hopefully. Because it is sort of pushing you away from that branch in the back that we've talked about so eloquently this entire time. But we've framed it now. Look at how this deadwood, I'll show it here first. Look at how this deadwood interacts with this space, okay, in terms of fracture and carrying that thematic. Look at how this deadwood interacts with all this space. You guys see that? See how it interacts with that space and the deadwood in the back? Thematically, we've created consistency. It's interesting, right? Very rough right now, but very interesting. OK, so let's keep going. All right? What happens with this? What do we do with this? Oh, no. Do we go that way? Do we go this way? You guys are like, whatever, dude. Okay. Just do it. Feels, it feels hard to pull it to the left, doesn't it? But if we go to the right, it starts to cover up the exact thing we just tried to open up here. Ah! All right, let's see what's going to happen there. I've got an idea.
Do Sierra junipers have multiple apices in the natural environment? Do they? Yeah? Yeah, what do you think? Oh, you got to type in ancient Sierra Juniper. I know Juniper. we have a good blog on it. Huh? We have a blog called Sierra Juniper Gallery. Yeah, yeah we've got on a blog on bonesimerai.com. Were you talking? Do you want to say something? No, okay. Yeah, I remember making a good blog on it. Someone sent us a bunch of photos. And, uh, They're massive. And did they, did they look like bonsai? Let me look. I'll, be, I'll pull it up right now. Let me, let me take a little gander. So I'm going to guess that you're going to see a very, very complex form of branches that form a lot of sub pads. It's very billowy. Sierra juniper is very billowy, less formal. When we start to look at the characteristics of Sierra juniper that we can utilize in bonsai, we're not going to have the same, like you guys look at the Tscomo cypress in the exhibition, okay? The Tscomo cypress in the exhibition has a scale of foliage that's going to dictate the size of the pads. Scale of the tree does as well, but we've got to reference that scale of foliage in order to be able to really, really sort of hone in on the, the size of tree we represent in that form. Sierra juniper, this is very coarse foliage. In Japan, they would say it's too coarse, right? But if you can utilize it, if you can utilize it to convey a really interesting image, if you can pull on that billowy nature of Sierra juniper, it starts to be very, very powerful. Very powerful image, softer image, cloudier image uh, of that tree. And this is natural and representative of how they occur in the environment. But one of the things that you'll notice when you start to look at them, the randomness of the occurrence of the foliage is what creates the natural form. And natural form adheres to all of the environmental conditions that are acting on Sierra juniper, and that's really what starts to give them that bonsai-ish form. They're following the contour, but where they deviate from the bonsai form is it is an abstracted, very abstracted sort of bonsai form. Has longer asymmetry, has sort of odd proportions. It doesn't fit that idyllic form. And that's where we're trying to take this tree. Let's see if we can deviate from that idyllic proportion, that idyllic form, and really create an interesting sort of finality to <clears throat> I told you guys I would do this just like I would in my workshop. And this is what it sounds like, too. Mr. Kramer used to tell me I was too loud. Right before you'd go, <laughs> the ideas of self-awareness I recognize don't apply to bonsai masters. You're so loud, Ryan. <clears throat> so anyway. <laughs> You know, and when you're an apprentice, you can't really, <laughs> you can't really say anything uh, about that. One time he was carving these stones to make his stone sculptures. And uh, his glasses, he raised his glasses up, and he was in a real big hurry, and he was being pretty panicky about it. And he started going, where's my glasses? Where's my glasses? And sort of took them off of his head and handed them to him as one of those, like, easy, easy. Calm down. Calm down. You're Okay. Okay, this is where we're headed. I'm going to continue to work at it. You guys notice how gradual the process, not gradual, I mean, we cleaned it, things changed dramatically. We're bending things big time. But once we get to sort of that far side of the bend, of the move, it's sort of this, at that point, it's incrementally smaller, the changes that occur. Have you noticed that? You guys watching that? So big bend to take this off of vertical. <clears throat> and then small moves once we get into this space. Smaller and smaller as we sort of rein it in. <clears throat> Come a little bit more to the foreground here. And then I'm going to spin this so you guys can tell me if you like it or not. 
Working hard for BSOP today. Okay, how's this? I'll start here and give it to you guys. How's that? Don't make a knee jerk. Take a little bit of time. How is it? Who needs it? Definitely pulled oh, it down. On. How is it? Yay or nay? Ryan? Yeah. So if you look at from spin it around from the end, the other end, would those top branches you just guy wired, would they come in just a little bit to make it? In not this way? Yeah, and to make it not so square. Maybe. That's what Sky asked, too. And it's a second iteration, because we've got branches in here that are necessary, right? Second iteration. But when we start to look at, if we're creating this kind of asymmetry on this scale, and we're trying to talk about this, once we start to take this down, maybe this comes down a little bit more, but we've, we've truly pushed in here, and we're truly elongating over there, this is the, the big general design concept. Now, how we handle all of this stuff to lay this out and form those billowy solid masses in here, this starts to become where the technique is involved. But this structural setting is really what sets the tone for that final image, OK? So we've got to be very conceptual about this, because when we have these, if I just drop this branch down here, and I just this is a branch, and this is a branch, and this is a branch, everything about what's special is gone. We've just completely domesticated the most wild piece of material that we have in front of us. So this is where, when you guys are looking at this, and you're saying, I like it, I don't like it, I feel comfortable, I don't feel comfortable, you're really challenging what you've come to accept as the way to style a bonsai, right? Now, the merit in this is whether or not the final execution of it, when you see it, with the structure that's been set that deviates from that standard box that we exist in, what that power and impression of that tree is. And that's where I'm trying to get. I'm a pretty, pretty big fan of what's happening right now, though. Yeah? This one? So we didn't want to bring it here. I didn't want to bring it here. So why is the tip going this way? I didn't want to bring it here. I didn't want to bring it in front of here. So I'm kind of going in that direction without giving it so much length. And eventually, this is just going to be, we talked about this as these billowy tufts, right? This will be one of those billows sort of that informality of the Sierra Junipers where we're at. OK, let's get the back done. This is not going to be dramatic in any stretch of the imagination. Hey, Ryan, real quick question about those two. It almost, from here, seems that they're level. Uh-huh. That's a little hard for me to see. Yeah. She said, like, it looks almost boxy because they're a little, little boxy in terms of the movement and stuff. So that's something that once we've wired those finer branches out and we see that billow, we can drop one or elevate one. Currently, if we're in the wheelhouse and we're in the ballpark, we can't see what the totality of that is going to be. So we'll make those finest adjustments at the very end. Yeah, but that's a great, great point. Yeah, and this, this scope of work, what you're seeing right now, yesterday in the workshop, it took us until took us until 2 p.m., right? We started at 8.30. Took us until 2 p.m. to get the structure of every one of those spruce set. There were only six, right? But six complex, complex design problems that we had to solve as a group. And then we had to go through and we had to clean and prepare them. And then we had to go through and branch select and then set the structure. So 2 p.m., the final spruce was set. And we came very close to all six spruce finishing between 2 and 5. So from 8.30 to 2, it took us that much time to clean, design, set structure. From 2 to 5, every single smaller branch on that tree was wired out. Right? And that shows you that, that division of labor and the division of priority of the scope of work. This, this current scope of work on this tree, this will be the most significant significant work, because we're making decisions. We don't go back on these decisions. We established a design sort of theory based on all the cerebral discussion we had at the beginning. As we were talking about all that, as I was conveying that information, 
that, that information was guiding my process, and now you're starting to see it, and this is challenging. This is challenging every one of you aesthetically, right? It's challenging me aesthetically. But would you rather see a demonstration where I stand up here and turn this into a bonsai? That's the continual question that I will, I will come back to for you guys. Would you rather this be turned into one of those forms that has that proportion that we see every other time? Because I could do that. I could do that. It'd be very easy to do that. I would probably already be through the structure. It would have half as many branches. And I would be close to finishing by the end of this demonstration. But what would the power of that final image be? A big, thick trunk, some deadwood, and a live vein? Eh, I'm tired of that. Right. Yes. What made, your what made your philosophy change from your perspective of creating a tree like this as opposed to what you just said? And yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a big question. Uh, it's actually a very personal story, but I'll share it with you. Um, huh? Yeah. Uh, what, so the question is, in case you guys couldn't hear, what changed my philosophy from from creating a, a, a tree that, that represents sort of the bone type proportion to this. So, so first and foremost, before I went to Japan, uh, I already knew that I wanted to be, I knew what was in the mountains I collected when I was 12 years old and on with my father in Colorado in the Rockies. Um, I spent all of my high school or college time at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo on the weekends in the Sierra Nevadas, um, collecting a lot of material. And uh, I, knew what was, I knew what was possible, I knew what was present. And I went to Japan with the knowledge of what was present. I actually went there with a very narrow-minded desire to learn how Mr. Kimura handled his pines and how he planted things on stones. That's really why I went to Japan. That's what I wanted to know. Now, I got there, and, and the first day, he taught me how to clean the needles on a white pine. I totally screwed that up. He taught me how to delineate the living vein on a juniper. I fully hosed that up as well and I recognized that I had no clue what I was doing and it was really good that I was there. So over the course of six years, you know, I started out as the youngest of six apprentices um, and was the, basically the peon, which you are as the youngest and you pay your dues and that's appropriate and I don't uh, have any conflict with the way that that was handled. I think that it was very, very appropriate. Um, it's, it's how you sort of, it's how you earn your medal it's how you deconstruct a lot of the things that are going to impair your ability to learn bonsai. And, uh, and it was very, very formative and fruitful for me to go through that. But um, over the course of my apprenticeship in Japan, the youngest of six to the middle of three within the first 18 months to the oldest of two, uh, at the um, sort of 21 mar month mark and at the 24 month mark, I was the only apprentice left. So for nine months, it was just me and Mr. Kimura. And he had over 1,200 trees that he had six apprentices maintaining and then three apprentices maintaining and then two apprentices maintaining and then one apprentice maintaining 1,200 trees. That experience over those nine months is actually why I can operate Bonsai Marai. Because I learned how you efficiently and effectively manage a nursery of that scale and that quality, how you prioritize, how you get the job done, how you identify and stay on top of things to the best of your ability. And the fundamental fact of the matter is it can't all be perfect in that situation, but it was the biggest period of growth. That's what made me want to create Mirai, okay? Afterwards, I got a younger apprentice, Moriyama-kun, uh, he's like my little brother. When he first started, Mr. Kimura told me I had to be nice to him because if he quit, we would be in trouble. So as I was staying till midnight and getting there at 6 as this, the oldest apprentice, and he was showing up at 9 or 10 and going home at 7, you know, I, I, had, I was already institutionalized to what it looked like to be a really, really hard-nosed, disciplined apprentice with Mr. Kimura because he's a very difficult man to study with. He's extremely intense, he's extremely demanding, that nothing is ever good enough, and it's what keeps his apprentices growing and on the top of their game. Again, I think that's very appropriate, it's very valuable for me. 
Anyways, um, by the time I left after the, at the end of my sixth year, I was the oldest of five apprentices. And I'd crossed the language barrier. I'd crossed the cultural barrier. Uh, and <clears throat> sort of taken on a lot of those challenges that being an apprentice demands that you take on. And so I came home to the United States and <clears throat> was home for, let's see, a period of four or five months, and I went back to Japan. And it was interesting, because you don't know what it's going to be like to jump back into that role as a, a lead apprentice of this family of really prestigious Japanese bonsai professionals and uh, you know, all of these younger apprentices that you're guiding through the process and this master that you revere as, as almost a godlike figure. And you strive so hard, really, really hard to be everything that he wants you to be. And you work hard for that. And then, uh, you know, five months go by and you come back. And as a foreigner, I was no longer a part of the family. So I'd worked all that time to become accepted. And when I went back, I was no longer accepted. So it was a really interesting experience to, to, to be in that position, because all I had wanted was his approval and his acceptance. And I'd gotten it, and I'd sat at the top of the best bonsai nursery in the world, and I'd trained the next generation of apprentices, and I'd upheld the integrity of his model and his lineage of apprentices. I, I did not want to break that, and I did things that went against the grain of who I was as a person and what I stood for morally to uphold that. And so at that point in time, I had been really impaired from doing what I wanted to do design-wise because I had this echo of what would Mr. Camaro want, what would Mr. Camaro want, what would Mr. Camaro want in my head. And when I was kind of rejected from that family and I recognized all these things that I thought that I had accomplished and this acceptance that I thought that I had gained was as flippant as five months, I said, fuck it. And I came back to the United States, and I changed every tree that I had designed, and I developed a huge chip on my shoulder, and I said, I want American Boneside to be better than what's there. And that pretty much has been the driving force for me in terms of all of the exploration and all of the effort and all of the sort of what I've invested into this. And now... It's not so, it's not so rebellious, rebellious in terms of my mentality around it. It's not so aggressive and it's not so resentful. But that was what started the process. That was what started to say, I don't think we're inferior and in fact, I think we have something to offer that isn't the same as that and we're never gonna be accepted as that. And I'll never fully understand that because I tried for six years. And I recognized no matter how long I stayed in that apprenticeship, I was never going to be that, right? So why try? Why keep going against the grain? Why keep trying to pound you know, a square peg in a round hole? It's never going to go in. We're never going to be able to do Japanese bonsai. We're just not. We're only going to be able to create a cheap representation of it. So why keep trying when we're dealing with trees that don't behave and we're in a culture that doesn't conform it doesn't make any sense, and I, I, I try to constructively convey that, um, but ultimately it comes down to that really significant <laughs> experience and quite a bit of heartbreak that freed me from that, and I'm glad that it did because it's, it's created an entirely new movement and concept of what bonsai can be that I never would have had uh, had I continued to be accepted. So. Anyways, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was very interesting. When I was at the national show, my senpai, Arushabata son, was the judge there. <clears throat> and people ask me a lot. They, they talk with me a lot about my apprenticeship. They talk with, they, they ask, you, are you and Mr. Kimura friends now? <laughs> That's, uh, that's not the way that it works. You know, I went back and I translated him and uh, translated for him at the World Bonsai Convention last year in Saitama, you know, and did he miss you? What did you guys talk about? You know, no, I showed up at his nursery. He said, it's been a long time and the, and the ground is dirty. And I picked up a broom and I started cleaning. And I knew that was the way it's going to be. It didn't surprise me. 
It was absolutely acceptable. That's my role in my life in Japan, and, and that's never going to change, and I'm happy for that. Right? I, don't, I don't feel like Mr. Kimura owes me anything, quite the opposite. Mr. Kimura gave me the gift to be on stage in front of you guys. We've started Mirai Live. It's taking over the Bonsai world. Uh, we're making a big impact. Bonsai in the United States is going like this. Bonsai in Japan is going like this. You pick which route you want to be on. I'm here. That's where I want to be, with you guys. Okay? But he's the one who created the ability for me to do this. I don't want my role there to change. But it is interesting to engage with all of the elements of that, my senpai, that always had sort of that hierarchical, there's a hierarchical clout to that system. There's a, a reverence and respect that never goes away. But when you step outside of that environment, just the same as you step outside of that environment and your bone side changes, when you step outside of that environment, how does the human interaction change? This is, a, this is an odd situation to encounter as an individual that appreciates that experience, appreciates Mr. Kimura's guidance, appreciates Arushabhata son's mentorship as my senpai, but also is not willing, I'm not willing to conform because we're not in that culture now, right? So there's respect, there's appreciation, but when we're both bonsai professionals on the same stage, which I'll be demonstrating next to my senpai at Nolander's trophy next year, Fujikawa, I'm there to do the same job he is. How do you confront that in that hierarchical structure in that country and this international bonsai world where we're both professionals being paid to do the very best work? This is interesting, right? These are confluences of culture and confluences of concepts that nobody's had to confront to this date, right? Very, very interesting. It's the same tension that's created in trying to take bonsai out of its safe box. So if you're not willing to confront that, then it starts to become very difficult to evolve beyond that or come up with something outside of that. And that's not to say that it's wrong, it's to say that it's different, and they can exist together. It's very, very, this kind of tension is what generates the, the, the dialogue in art, right? Okay, so I've compressed this. Now, here's what I'm thinking about in terms of this tree. When we look at the Sierra Nevadas and we look at the Sierra Junipers, you really see in those contorted forms, I said they look like bonsai, it's the only species I've seen look like bonsai, and the wind hits here, right, and then it rolls over this tree, and then it blasts out that side, and this is what creates this really radical asymmetry. Okay, never seen anybody do that to a tree before. Okay. So I may choose to lower this, right? Because inside of this, I'm not interested in all of these tiny little pads and showing this, okay? I'm gonna wire it more than this, trust me, okay? But I want, the, I want that billowy, I wanna show that, I wanna carry that aesthetic forward, just this and It sounds just like that too, okay? So when we see this, right, this is, this is, this is abstracted, yet again, abstracted from the concept representative of the environment, pulling on these characteristics. That asymmetry is supported by this. It's a meshing of all concepts, totally congruent in terms of the creation of the piece. How are we doing for time? I got another hour? Awesome. All right, I'm going to dig into this branch here, and let's start to form that billowy nature. I want to walk through that billowy nature. What does that look like? How do we create that? Hmm. Okay. Blue smoke. Blue smoke. Uh. I'm really happy so far. I think this is going swimmingly well. You guys too? Yeah? Are you at all uncomfortable by the conversation style and nature of this demonstration? <laughs> this has been a unique one, yeah? Yeah, this has been unique. Special for me too. I've never almost cried in a demonstration. And keep me on my toes, you guys. Let's not, let's not talk about my childhood, okay? I'm just, I had a great childhood. 
Huh? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Todd and I have something in common. I didn't actually cry. Let's just be straight for the record. <laughs> Almost, yeah. The power of BSOP, the therapeutic. Does someone have a question? Oh, Scott. All right, so I'm going to handle this in pretty, in pretty big, broad brush strokes, but each one of these branches is going to have to be handled. And if you guys want to see the detail, it's not on the screen right now. <laughs> So don't worry about it. I'll get it to you when I'm ready. That's what's happening? Oh, people at home, because, okay, well, I got detail for you guys. And if you guys want to see detail later, it'll be on the archive. Hey, Ryan. Yo. I know that you uh, switched down to that lower branch, but um, when you get a chance sometime, I was wondering what your thoughts are on the apex and the placement of that and shifting that left or right, how that affects the design and that powerful movement that you talked about. Yeah, yeah. And what's safe and what's comfortable and what's dynamic. Gotcha. I'm happy to cross that bridge. Let me get this first branch. Let me set style. So after we do this structure, okay, let's go back to the structure. After we do this structure, and pretty much every, every heavy branch is set now. There's a few little stragglers here. That's an easy set. There's a few of these beefy guys, easy sets. Once we set this structure now, we've got to define style of the tree. And you guys are all like, wait, the style of the tree is defined. Yes, conceptually it is. Structurally it is. Okay, but when we start talking stylistically, the structure carries forward sort of the nuance and the characteristic of the tree and the environment. Now we start to talk about, when we form these branch paths, now we start to talk about scale. We start to talk about masculinity, and we start to talk about elements that are creating those paths. And we're saying, listen, wind, we're saying this is a massive tree, but we're also saying that Sierra junipers function inside of this dense billowy cloud. So we're going to have to oscillate inside of all of that, and we have to tease that out in this defining branch. Now, defining branch is different than the first branch, even though our defining branch on this tree is the first branch, it's the lowest branch, it doesn't have to be. And the defining branch creates the asymmetry. Okay? So if we were to pull this branch and shorten this branch back, this could become our defining branch. We decided we're going to go ahead and push this to the far degree. So currently, this is going to be our defining branch. We're going to set the tone and style, size of pad, width of pad, the way that we break up the pads right here, right now. And this is going to carry through the rest of the tree to inform every decision we make after this. All right? So this is, when we talk about bonsai design, we talk so much about the apex, the apex, the apex, the apex. The apex is so tough. The apex is so difficult. I don't know how to style apexes. I've got to improve on apexes. Yes, this is true. We all need to improve on our apexes. But it, if we're talking about bonsai on a higher level, what we, what we need to spend more time with is dictating the style on the defining branch. And this is what took Mr. Kimura. If it took him six hours to wire a tree, two to three hours of that were spent on this branch fly through the rest of the tree, right? If I'm, if I'm gonna be exploring a new aesthetic, I'm gonna spend half my time on the structure, and then I'm gonna spend another 30% of my time on this defining branch. And what that means is the last portion of the tree you fly through because the structure is where it needs to be, the style is already set on the defining branch, and all of a sudden, all of this becomes very clear based on the time you've spent in these other components of the tree. This is an important aspect of bonsai. And this comes back to that idea of process. What do we see the least of? What do we know the least of? And what is most valuable to our bonsai practice? Process, 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 process. One of the things about my apprenticeship, one of the things about the way that we practice at Mirai, and one of the things that we teach on Mirai Live is process. Because if you don't know the process, how do you handle a tree like this? This would be impossible. If I didn't just set that whole structure, if I didn't create that concept, if I hadn't cleaned, cleaning, concept, structure, setting the style on my defining branch carries through the whole design. This is process. If you don't have any one of those steps or you change the order of those steps, you're never going to get to the final product. It'll overwhelm you. It's too much. It's too much. Too much of a tree, too much information, too much to think about. You have to have an organized approach to systematically be able to handle this or it will eat you alive. So I had all of these massive, massive trees that I'd collected for myself when I was in college. And I knew 
looking at books, looking at magazines, looking at European bonsai, reading bonsai today, I knew I can't do these trees justice. And so I went to Japan. And Mr. Kimura, from day one, started implementing process in a way that I had never seen. I didn't know how you go about cleaning a juniper to be able to, to actually get into the design. I didn't know how you conceptualize design. It was process, 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 constantly process. Same process from day one to the last day of year six. That consistency was so comforting and also so incredibly frustrating. So let's kind of talk about this, this idea of, of sort of exploring or changing the model, just, just as I'm wiring, because I'm, I'm going to be wiring for a while. Sorry, let me get out of the way, Jesus. Yeah, OK. So I'm going to be wiring for a while. And I want to I kind of talk you guys through this, because it's important that we have several things in order to be able to, in order to, be able to explore. There's no explorer that's exploring without a place to come home to. Do you know what I'm saying? Magellan knew where he could go back to Columbus. And I don't want to say anything offensive in, in, in the current situation about calling certain people explorers if they weren't good people. I don't know. I just, I'm going to quantify that for the live stream. It's a very delicate situation to talk about anything these days. But when we talk about an explorer, right? They always had a place to come back to. Maybe they were going back to Spain. Maybe they were going back to Portugal. Maybe they were going back to, uh, to the UK. When you start to talk about, right, and this is the same for Mr. Kimura when he started exploring the f greater degree of asymmetry in his model of bonsai. Uh, it's the same thing when you start to talk about uh, a lot of the impressionistic painters. They could always go home to what they started out from. And in bonsai, when, when we talk about this idea of, of let's be innovative, let's, let's branch out, let's explore, we also need to talk about where that home is because we've got to give ourselves a place to come home to, right? If, if the exploration fails, if we get lost, if we don't know where to go, we've always got to be able to come home. And this is where as much as we say, listen, there's a big impression of, of the uniqueness of the species and the environment and the culture that we live in. And all of these things impact bonsai. When I went to South Africa uh, in 2016, they had black pines and all of them have big, flat, expansive canopies, like we would see a bald cypress, right? They had olives, flat canopies, deciduous flat canopies. And I was sitting there and I was looking at it and I was like, well, this is really something interesting here. I've never seen this before. Uh, and then you went out into their environment and you saw the acacia and you saw the baobabs and you saw and you recognized, holy cow, this is, I mean, this is like a one to one. Uh, their environment is directly impacting their interpretation of a tree. It was powerful. It was very powerful, very pointed experience. And that was really when culture, nature and the individual, you recognize that culture and that natural environment and the person who's interpreting and filtering all of that information. And that is where bonsai comes from. Okay? So when we start to talk about that home, though, that home comes from the fundamentals that have been established from that practice that I'm, I'm proposing that we don't necessarily understand, but we do have to have fundamentals in order to be able to deviate from home. In order to leave Spain and find the United States, right, or find, find uh, uh, Brazil or wherever you're going, right, You've got to have a home to come back to if you get lost, to replenish, to, to rejuvenate, to, to sort of find that anchor that you can reference. And this is where I think there's a significant necessity for the element of orthodox bonsai design. No, I needed 14. I got this guy right here. This is, these are going to become Mike and Ike for me. Okay? This is where I think there is a significant element for bonsai design. So as much as I'm saying, let's push, let's push, let's evolve, let's evolve, we also need to do so with an awareness of the fundamentals and have that home to come back to. Does that make sense? Because there's a lot of times, for example, we did the lab project for the Pacific Bonsai Museum. Did anybody, anybody aware of the lab project? Did anybody see anything regarding the lab project? We did a we did a podcast, so I'm just going to be really honest. The lab project is easily the most challenging thing I've engaged with to date in bonsai. Because, because there was no box. What? It is awesome. It is awesome. And Aaron's goal in curating the lab project was to really challenge 
and not create a lot of boundaries and confines for Austin and Ron and I to collaborate inside of to see what the final product would be with that freedom. And guess what we all did, right? As much as I'm standing up here in, in sort of in my element, really trying to push the degree of this tree and this design, when confronted with the freedom, the freedom to push the level of design, all three of us freaked out and created something very comfortable and very uh, conformative of the pretty standard, traditional, accepted approach. It was amazing uh, that we all recoiled like that. And, and we talked about it afterwards. There's a podcast that is really hard to listen to because it's, there's a lot of argument and there's a lot of disagreement and it wasn't very constructive. But you know, I think all three of us were challenged by that project to a degree that I've never been challenged. And it, and it is the exploration that I think Aaron had designed. I think that's what he wanted. As much as it didn't look the way we all thought it would look, it was, it was amazing. Uh, and I'm excited to see where that project goes. But you, you inherently, in that discomfort, I went home. I went back to that starting point. I went back to that point of origin. I created a very mundane, with an, a phenomenal piece of material of a, of a limber pine, I created a very standard traditional boneside design because I was so out of my element and comfort zone. Right? I'm more comfortable here than I was in the lab project that day. It was, it, was, it was really interesting. Standing underneath this great expansive canopy of a Frank Lloyd Wright structure that was so oppressive. You know, I'm thinking, I love architecture, I love Frank Lloyd Wright. I'm thinking, I'm gonna stand under this Frank Lloyd Wright building and I'm gonna be inspired to create a bonsai that nobody's ever seen before. Like, I had these grandiose thoughts of what it was gonna do. It was the worst experience of my bonsai career. It was terrible. And I don't know why, I don't know why. It kind of relates to me, uh, and you guys have maybe heard me tell this story about uh, my experience with Koizumi, who is the owner of Green King Fertilizer. Have you guys ever heard this story of my apprenticeship? It's like the second or third week of my apprenticeship, and I'm unwiring this massive Zuisho white pine in the workshop. And uh, this client walks in. I've never seen him before. I don't know who he is. And the client walks in, and I'm unwiring this pine, and uh, he starts freaking out. Now, I don't speak Japanese very well at this time, but I could understand that he was very upset. And I couldn't understand why he was upset, but he kept telling me I was never going to be able to do bonsai. I was never going to be able to do bonsai. I didn't understand. I wasn't going to, I didn't have the skills. You know, maybe I was fumbling. Maybe I, I, I don't know, maybe I wasn't unwiring proficiently. It was like my second or third week. So it's possible that I, that I wasn't. And, um, and it was jarring. It was really, it was, it was abrupt. It was aggressive and it was very jarring. Um, anyways, every, Every time after that, so uh, he ended up parting ways with, um, with the garden that he had sort of been a patron of, Dai Juin, once the, the father of Dai Juin died. And you guys would know Dai Juin because Dai Juin created the Zuisho White Pine. This is the, the Suzuki family, not Shinji Suzuki, but the greater lineage of the Suzuki family, developed a lot of the black pine technique that we know of today, developed the Zuisho White Pine, really refined the needle juniper and brought it into prominence. This is a serious institution. Uh, but he had a parting of ways with them and all of those trees, like two, three hundred trees migrated to Mr. Kimura's over the six years that I was his apprentice uh, in Japan. And as these trees would come in, I wouldn't know because we had clients bringing in trees every single day. Trees, 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 tons of trees. Always trees, always trees. 1,200 trees at Mr. Kimura's, they were rotating like clockwork. We were like a finely oiled machine. Probably I did the calculations. I think I wired something like four or 5,000 trees during my apprenticeship. I mean, we're talking... We're talking more than a tree a day over six years, right? So if you take 365 days, you get very few days off once every two or three months, and you're talking about that over six years, and the better you get, the more trees you wire in a day. It's something like three or 4,000 trees that I handled during my apprenticeship. And coming home, it's been very similar to that as well. Maybe not quite that much, because I traveled a lot, but anyways, I like to think about it. So... <clears throat> We're doing all of this work and we've got all of these trees coming in and you don't know whose tree is whose, particularly when you don't write Japanese, although I could write it pretty well and I got to be able to read it pretty well. I didn't know which tree was Mr. Koizumi's or which was not, but there were trees that I would put my hands on in the garden and as I put my hands on them, I got a feeling, I got a sensation. 
And uh, sometimes it was very good, sometimes it was very bad. And I didn't know why, and it was one of the things that sort of propelled me to thinking about bonsai as a more collaborative process with an energy exchange with the tree, because there's really no reason to touch a tree and have it give you a good or bad sensation unless there's exchange of some sort of energy in that system. I would put my hands on these trees and I would feel bad. And what I came to identify is every single tree that was owned by Mr. Koizumi, whether I knew it or not, when I touched it, it gave me a sensation that was literally nauseating. Days seemed darker, depression was a bigger, was a bigger emotion more than joy. And I reveled in finishing those trees so that I didn't experience it. Put my hands on another tree in the same day, same day, 10 minute difference. Finish this one, next one starts. Feeling terrible, total relief didn't know whose tree that was. In my sixth year, I already knew. When I had that experience, this was a Koizumi tree, okay? So then as I'm sitting in this Frank Lloyd Wright structure doing the lab project with that kind of experience in the back of my mind, and it's continued, even to this day, it's continued at Bonsai Marai. Specific trees give specific sensations. I started thinking, why would a Frank Lloyd Wright structure have that kind of impact on me? Doesn't mean that it was the energy of the space, doesn't mean it has to be that woo-woo. But maybe it was, I don't know. Does anybody know what kind of human being Frank Lloyd Wright was? Oh, okay. If you look it up, you'll understand why I think there could be association. You guys get any feelings when you touch your trees? Yeah? Yeah? Lyme and I did a podcast one time we were talking about. Have you guys listened to the podcast? Asymmetry, yeah. There's like four or five podcasts. We did a podcast with Bill Valvanis. I learned more about Bill Valvanis in an hour talking to him at the national show. He is totally, totally unfiltered. Totally unfiltered about his bonsai practices, his career in bonsai, creation of the national show. It was incredible. It'll be coming out in the next couple of weeks. We also had Sarah Rayner over to the Airbnb house that the Mirai crew stayed at, and she just she just absolutely uh, was a, a peach and a gem to talk to. She's, she's an incredible uh, ceramicist, just an absolute wonder, uh, and it was amazing to get to dig into her ceramics practice. There's things in that podcast about Sarah Rayner that I guarantee none of you have ever thought about when you look at her work. Uh, I'm excited for the whole Boneside community to get to hear those two podcasts. Anyways, Lyme and I podcasted about... Um, about the impact of bonsai on our lives. And there's a, sort of a statement that we made where, you know, no matter what is going good or bad in a day, when you put your hands on a bonsai, it gets better. Have you guys had that experience? Yeah, it's, it's one of the big reasons why we do it. Uh, and inside of that, you could talk about it in a multitude of ways. Okay, so your mind is being relaxed or you're not thinking or, you know, flow state or all of the different reasons, you know, but but when I look at this, and, and I, I experience it when I'm demonstrating, I experience it in my own workshop, there comes a point where the tree starts absorbing a lot of the energy. Good or bad, it starts absorbing a lot of the energy. And this is, this is an interesting dynamic to cross over as a professional, because when you're a traveling professional, and you're, gen you're generating work on a consistent basis, all of a sudden you're giving energy every day. Now, how do you get energy back from bonsai? How does bonsai pay it back? by enjoying that tree, by seeing it change, by seeing it thrive, by watering it, by being sort of a part of that evolution and development. And when you're a traveling bonsai professional, you don't get to be that. You don't get that energy back. Now you get it back from your students that you see growing and their collections get better and you know, enthusiasm is, is, is rocking and rolling. All of those things pay it back. But ultimately, when you're giving so much energy to bonsai as an art form, you have to find a way to get it back from the trees. And this is really what makes and, and sort of formulates and, and, and generates the magic of bonsai and that relationship that we have with the tree. So going back to that idea that when you work with a tree, you sit down and you put your hands on it and it, <clears throat> and it makes your day better. It take, takes a lot of that, whatever that is, right? Takes a lot of that, whether it's your mind relaxing, whether it's the tree, you know, an energy exchange, and you can choose to think about it the same way as you choose to think about gravity or how oxen affects the tip of the branch. It's all the same in terms of quantification, and we can all believe in it in different ways, but there is an undeniable fact, and that is it exists. It exists, and it makes it magic, and it's really, really powerful. So I tried to transition from bad to good there. In case you guys, you know, I don't want to slander Frank Lloyd Wright because he was a genius, but his space really tore me up. 
You guys have any questions? The opposite impact. It had the opposite impact. Yeah, is and uh, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know about Mr. Wright at that point in time, so I was like virgin, you know, experience to it. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you could say, "Well, now my bias influenced that experience," and that's probably true, right? The placebo effect is real. Bias is real. Yeah, falling water was was uh, pretty monumental, and it's tough to deny. You know, when you start to when you look at, and um, as I was writing to the national show, there was a journalist that was riding in the truck with me to New York, and he's, he's really diving deep into bonsai. Uh, I'll be excited to read whatever comes out that he writes. He's a tremendous author. He's a tremendous um, journalist, and, and somehow he's found this relationship to bonsai that he wants to document. He doesn't do bonsai. Uh, but he wants to write about it in a way that I don't think anybody's written about it before, and that's really exciting for our community. Um, but, uh, hang on just a second. Where was I? There was a journalist writing with me. What was before that? Frank, Le ah, okay. He was saying, because he was in Japan and watching Mr. Kimura work and observing his work and getting the history of Mr. Kimura and starting to understand the significance, he was saying, basically, you almost have a Picasso-like figure of bonsai in this really innovative mind. That is Mr. Kimura. Mr. Kimura altered the art form in a way that nobody's really quantified yet. Very, 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 very of his time, very brilliant genius and all of the things that come with that. And um, I don't think, because bonsai is not the same as painting and bonsai is not the same as sculpture and there aren't museums full of bonsai to the degree that the Met and MoMA and the Guggenheim exist, I don't think that we've fully recognized the impact in terms of where bonsai can go, the exposure to the community. The lack of availability of bonsai hasn't impacted the world in the same way that other mediums of art have. But uh, I think at some point in the future, when more and more exposure is brought to the art form, we're going to recognize that we've been really fortunate to be around figures that have, have been innovative in a way that's going to impact other art forms significantly. And it's going to be cool when that happens, because we'll fi finally, finally see Boneside take that next step. OK, so as I'm working, I'm just kind of, just kind of teasing. I'm kind of, kind of flirting and playing with, how does this look? How thick is it? How wide is it? How are the tips handled? How is the style? How is the design? You know, I'm talking with you guys and just sort, just sort of kind of letting, letting a lot of it happen and seeing how I feel about it. Feels nice. Feels neat, like it needs to be a little thicker. I don't want to make it too small. So we'll keep, we'll keep working. But this, this area here, again, is going to define everything. Okay? Um, yeah, the article, he's not sure. He's not sure, and uh, and I don't think I don't think he got what he needed uh, from from that trip. So I don't know. Yeah. Got to have drama to get into periodicals, and and the the national show wasn't dramatic enough. There wasn't there wasn't anybody backstabbing and slandering each other. There wasn't the excitement of reality TV there. It was just all good vibes. He was kind of like, well, this is shoot, you know? <laughs> the magazine won't buy this. <laughs> I was really I was really excited by that. Who here went to the national show? Anybody? Yeah, Howard, yeah, yeah. Howard, what was your impression of the national show? Hang on, you got, we got a mic? I'm really, I'm really putting you on the spot here, online, live. Howard Griesler, what's your thought of the national show? Brian, you won't scare me. <laughs> cool. I enjoyed it. I thought that the show probably was better than the past couple of years. Ah, nice. I think that there's still too many trees so that the lower end of the quality spectrum was lower than ideal. Uh -huh. uh, I thought the camaraderie and the social aspects were absolutely wonderful. It was awesome. a really good show. Yeah, yeah. I was, uh, I, was, I was blown away. There's only one, 
There's only one bonsai organization in the United States that I've witnessed be relatively low or void of politics. It could be my ignorance, but, but BSOP is a very special community because of the camaraderie that exists here with you guys. And, and if you haven't engaged with bonsai around the United States, it's hard to understand and, and know and appreciate how fortunate you are that there's such a community and a camaraderie within the community that makes it very open and safe and available for you guys to engage with bonsai on that level. But uh, it's interesting because I think as the United States and as North America, and I say United States, but I do need to say North America because the Canadian contingency that was at the national show Blue Mines. I mean, their trees were like whew, real, real good. Um, but when we talk about North America, I think as, as we develop our own identity, you start to become more confident and there's a lot less reason to be there's a lot less reason for, for the political maneuvering. There's a lot less right or wrong, and there's more of an acceptance of everybody's approach. And I really felt like the national show, and I also feel like, you know, Bonsai Society of Portland has had this for a long time, but that just that general understanding that Bonsai is an expression, and there's a lot more, um, there's a lot more acceptance of that with an increase in confidence, and there's a lot more acceptance of that with an increase of knowledge because it's not about what's right and wrong, it's about the interpretation. And, and it was really apparent on a national level at the national show. I thought that was, that was, that was the biggest takeaway, was just the amount of optimism that was present. And um, to continue it this weekend at, at, at BSOP with this, and the number of people that were at the national show and that are here now, is pretty amazing that, uh, that we're starting to get this kind of nationwide community forming because, um, because it allows us to do very special things when we start working as a team and as a group. Okay, so there's a few fundamental things, you know, when I say coming, coming back home when we're innovating. There's a few fundamental things that I haven't been able to find a replacement for or uh, haven't needed to or haven't wanted to in terms of, of stylistic uh, deviations from, from that more traditional model. And one of those is branch pad formation because I think even in the traditional bonsai form and the traditional bonsai model, that branch pad formation is a very consistent, logically created uh, shape and, and distribution and um, sort of movement that's put into the branches that, that, that has uh, an intelligent background. And that is, you know, as I'm creating this, one thing that you guys will notice is all of these smaller, finer branches, they're not really contrived and contorted. I'm not creating radical shapes in the finer ramification of the tree. I've already, I've already done, there's already enough of that, right? And this, these branches, when we start to try and execute design where we're emphasizing the natural characteristics of this very wild tree, the branching characteristics that allow us to truly tap into that potential mean we don't need to overly manipulate that all the way to the tip. And in fact, in terms of an age and in terms of a justification for that really contorted shape, yes, this trunk has hundreds of years to have that. Yes, that primary structure can accommodate that, carry forward that aesthetic and that um, general trend and, and continuity and ethos. But those finer branches are always new. Always new, always original, always very, very photosynthetically driven. It's the same system of water movement. It's not a decision to be this way, right? It's how growth is naturally occurring. So when we form these pads, you know, and we're talking about this bonsai pad, we've got that primary branch as the structure. We've got secondaries that originate from the primary. Those secondaries, when I'm styling, always in towards the primary and out always in towards the primary and out. And what that, what that does is it naturally creates that fan shape, okay? Now maybe we want that fan shape in terms of a traditional form. When we start to get into wind, we want to funnel that fan shape back into a more pointed, more triangular form because that streamline effect of the wind starts to drive and direct that growth to the pinnacle of that wind. Whenever you see something whipping, hair in the wind, there's always a point, there's always a finality to that solid object that's experiencing wind. Branches are no different. That sail effect carries that streamline effect and anything that exists outside of that gets torn apart, right? 
So when we're looking at these branches, we can go here as a bonsai form, we can go here as a streamlined form, and that's where we start to see that impact, but into the main and then out, however wide we go to the pad or narrow to the triangular form, this is what dictates branch formation, and I've never found a better way to go about it. It's a very fundamental, simple, very strategic execution. That makes sense? Yeah? So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna start to pull this in a little bit because I've shown you the bonsai form and let's see what a little bit more of that streamlined form looks like and we can decide which one we feel is better for this tree. I wanna be very careful to not overly domesticate this tree and I feel like the fan-shaped form is gonna be very domesticating. Now, it's unfortunate because Sierra junipers naturally lend themselves to be very, very good bonsai. And I think I'm going to need to put more movement into this. This feels a little blasé for wind, doesn't it? It feels a little mm, kind of like we didn't really try, like we didn't know what we were doing when we first started. And actually, that's a really good indication of what happened when we first started. Because <laughs> we had no clue where we were going with this. <clears throat> mm. How are we doing on time? 40 minutes left? Yep. Well, clearly we're not going to finish, so I'll, I'll just let go of that pressure now. <laughs> Can you guys ever forgive me? <laughs> ah, thank you. <laughs> we'll try. We'll, try. We'll, give it a, we'll, give, we'll give it a good effort. <laughs> you better believe it. We took the before... Beautiful video. I knew, I knew that it was impossible to finish. Uh, as, as, as cool as it is to do demos and finish and create exciting work and stuff, progressing more, the process, the process truly is more important to me than the finished product. And you guys have gotten to see uh, a process on a tree that... On video, it's powerful. In person, it's a completely different experience. You know, uh, there's, a, there's, there's a visceral sort of, uh, you hear, you see, you smell, you get to, get to be a part of. And getting to do this kind of work in, in a situation where you guys are present is not something that I've ever experienced before. So th this is a learning experience for me too. I knew I wasn't gonna finish but uh, I wanted to create a powerful image, and then, yeah, we'll definitely document it and, and show you guys the finished product. Hey, Ryan? Yeah. In the detail cam, it shows where you have the, there's a whole bunch of branches, like, spoking off of that one little spot that right you're here. wiring out right there. Yeah, right here. Uh, would you address that eventually, or? Um, eventually, we'll have to address it, right? And in all actuality, what I'm kind of doing it, in, in this change, as I'm narrowing this down from this big fan shape that I had originally, I'm kind of necking this down to this point. This is becoming the predominant point. And what you're going to see when I show you this again is you're going to see sort of that, um, that transition from that more fan shaped pad to a much more directionally specific orientation of the pad. And that's, that's sort of that shift from that bonsai form to the more wind influenced triangular form that I'm trying to get at in, in the work here. And so this is where, again, I told you guys, the structure is going to take, you know, 40%, 50% of the time. And then of the remaining time, 30% is going to be spent on this pad. If you just go through and you wire this as a bonsai and you accept, and this is the mistake I made in the lab project, I accepted that. I felt the crunch. I didn't take the time. I didn't step back. I didn't really give myself the opportunity to really think about. You know, just the same as I just changed this movement. Let, let's just look at that movement now compared to the original movement. Is it better? A little more wild, a little more contorted, right? A little bit more appropriate for the material. Now, I could go safe. I could go very smooth. Look at the one above it, okay? This is what it was. 
this is what it is. Which one feels more appropriate for the material? The bottom one. It's more interesting, right? Now, if I did the whole tree with this very fluid lines, you guys would look at it and you'd say, cool, good bonsai, good, good, right? But if you then went back and you changed everything, you took that step back in time to dial in that defining branch and you followed that thematically throughout the rest of the tree, the final image is going to be not just another level, it's going to be exponentially more powerful, okay? So I, uh, when I teach at Mirai, and there's a lot of Mirai students here that will all be able to appreciate this, I cut off a bunch of branches. And when I'm teaching wiring, I hand my students cut off branches. That's, that's how Mr. Kramer taught me. It seemed very effective and very safe for his trees to teach me on dead branches. And it's always so funny because when, when we're learning how to wire, you know, you're focused on the fundamentals of wiring, and it's overwhelming. It's, wiring is a lot to think about. There's a lot of logic behind it. There's a lot of technique behind it. There's a lot of organization behind it. And all of us in this room, if we've wired a bone tie, have experienced that challenge, okay? But we've got these cut-off branches, and I always say, listen, if we're going to wire the structural wire, if, or the structural branches, bend them, bend them. Bend them, start that as the movement, create the interest. Because we're saying through the finer branches on the tree, we don't have the ability or we shouldn't try to utilize the finer branches on the tree to really execute the interest. The finer branches on the tree should be carrying forward that really youthful shape, very simple shape, very clean shape. We're just creating the positive space. That structure, that structure is really what has the ability to carry the interest. So bend them. And inevitably, with these cut-off branches, everybody's like, I didn't want to break it. I, uh, it's like, but it's already dead, right? It's already dead. It's been the living crap out of it. And in doing so, you start to be able to have that confidence when we're dealing with a tree of this nature to really crank. Because what the movement that we're putting into this collected tree is, is pretty significant. That was, a big, that was a big shift right there. Do I have a, uh, when I was in Japan or now? Both. When I was in Japan, did I have a favorite tree to wire? You know, uh, Japanese white pine is one of the most beautiful, beautiful uh, trees to wire. And the reason for it is, is it's so smooth and so uh, streamlined and very sensual. And it's not... It's not a, that sounded a little erotic. I didn't mean to, that's why I didn't mean to go that far. It, it, but it is. It's very, it's very elegant. There we go. Sens not sensual, elegant. Uh, and I like that because you've got these tufts of these soft blue needles, and a really quality needle has this beautiful angle. And in Japan, the value of Japanese white pine is based on quality of needle and then quality of tree. Okay, so the needle mass really dictates and determines the, the price and value of, of white pine. And there, there's tons of Pinus parvaflora that are not, are not delineated by species. It's not a subspecies, it's not a cultivar, but you have Nasu, you have Fukushima, you have uh, Tohoku, different Pinus parvaflora. They're all Pinus parvaflora from different regions of the mountains that have very specific foyer characteristic, bark characteristics, etc. And they're very valued for their individual characters. And there's a lot of regional pride around that, those individual characteristics. Um, I really enjoyed all of those nuances in that species. In the United States, my favorite tree is the ponderosa pine. And it's the ponderosa pine for so many different reasons, but mainly because when we all think of our origin of bonsai passion or our origin of awareness of plant material, if we really think long and hard, what is the first tree that we remember, or what is our impression of a tree? Usually that tree is a tree that we grew up around. And I grew up around ponderosa pine going to my family's uh, fourth generation fishing hole on the flat tops in western Colorado, and I passed through 
It's the only forest that I really remember from my really young childhood because we would be driving and I would always be sleeping in the early morning and looking up. The, the, there would be no roof on the Jeep. And when we had passed through the Ponderosa Pine Forest, the branches would be spread across the road. And I always remember seeing those needles and the wind passing through them. And that's my first memory of a tree. And it's never changed. When I, when I saw my very first collected tree visiting Harold Sasaki at Colorado Bonsai Limited, he had these contorted ponderosa pines. And I was so smitten with them, their, their angles and their bark and the needles being a lot freer than, than the bonsai I had seen in magazines. And I just thought that, that that's what I'm going to do with my life. Uh, and still to this day, if this were a ponderosa pine of this size, I would already be done wiring it because <laughs> the needles are big and the branches are few and it makes for very quick, dramatic work and it's very, very fun. Very fluid like the white pine, uh, nuanced with the freedom of uh, cultural representation, more uh, accurate and identifiable to where I grew up. And uh, yeah, I, I really enjoy that. I enjoy the freedom, I enjoy the flexibility, and I enjoy the fluidity of, of both of those species. I feel like I'm having a counseling session or something. <laughs> it's probably from my lack of sleep. You know, you lose that filter, and then you get home, and then you're like, what did I tell them about today? Jesus. Do, Kendall, do I seem abnormally emotional today? No? Okay, cool. Okay. Par for the course. Par for the course there. <laughs> Pretty par for the course. Phew. So this is what I sound like on Mariah Live, huh? <laughs> huh? Oh, usually there's more? Get on the mic, then I'm like, I'm going to yell at myself for not talking to the mic. Yeah, right. Usually I talk to you more, so it's probably, it doesn't feel like you're talking to yourself. Ah. That's... I think that's what's missing. It does feel, it does very much feel sort of... A little lonely of, up there. Ah, it is a little lonely, yeah. Not as many questions. Yeah, we're with you. We're bound by bonsai. It's a great tree, though. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you take, you take kind of big risks trying to do this kind of work on this scale. Um, but I think I'm going to be happy having done so. It's not, definitely not your standard demo. The uh, genus me, on Sierra, what is, or the, the Latin name, it's uh, Juniperus Occidentalis oh, Australis. 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 That's, Australis. That's right. This is the southern variety of Occidentalis. Can anybody tell me the northern variety of Occidentalis? Northern in terms of the Pacific Coast ranges. How's that? That's a hint. Huh? I'm not going to ruin it. Yeah, don't ruin it. Someone else. Somebody better. Go for it. Somebody better know this. You guys know it. Maybe it's just a question. Maybe. No, no, it's a juniper. Juniper, yeah. So, Juniperus occidentalis. Subspecies. Australis. Blank. Australis is the southern variety. What huh? do you want to say, Bert? Occidentalis occidentalis. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was, you got it? Occidentalis occidentalis. Yeah. So, what, what's the common name for that? Western. Western. Western juniper, right? That's interesting to think of the one that grows at the higher elevation, right? This is where we start to, this is where language breaks down. So the Sierra juniper grows at a far, far higher elevation than Western juniper uh, and grows in the southern portion of the Sierra Nevadas, whereas the Western grows in the Cascades. And uh, and I've always thought it interesting, too, that I have such a problem with Western juniper being Occidentalis Occidentalis and Sierra juniper being Occidentalis Australis, because I want the Sierra juniper to be sort of the more pure Occidentalis Occidentalis. I have, a, I have some sort of uh, issue with that. This is the same thing as thinking about the lodgepole pine and the shore pine, where you have Pinus uh, contorta contorta, which is the shore, and contorta latifolia, which is the lodgepole. And I guess I feel like the lodgepole should be contorta contorta because it's more contorted. 
And that's some real horticultural humor there. Like, yeah, we got some was, good chuckles. That was real that deep. That was good. That was real deep. Like, gee dang it, it is more contorta, isn't gee it? Gee dang it. Why would you call it contorta, contorta? Anyways. So when you guys think about, you know, we, uh, thematically, let's, uh, let's come back to the idea of sort of reflecting environment and talking about these characteristics, particularly as it comes to juniper, right? Because when you come back to uh, the western juniper, where does western juniper grow? How many people have seen western juniper in the natural environment? Scott has, yeah, all right, a few people, okay. Where does it grow? Desert. High desert. High desert, right? But the desert. And so where it grows, what, is it dead, what, it's, what does its deadwood look like? Is it? Is it? Sunbaked. Sun Very good. Sunbaked is different than sandblasted, right? So if we had a gin on a western juniper, would it have a lot of grain exposed? Would it be rather cylindrical? Would it have a lot of texture? What would you typically see of a western juniper? Could be checked. Could be checked. Could have some linear fissures where the, the, the tissue has shrank, but very smooth. Exactly. Very, very smooth because we're talking about sun baked, right? Now, if we go to the Rocky Mountains where you're talking about, and I just drove through uh, Wyoming so I can, I can attest to this, the wind in Wyoming is nonstop, okay? You take that element where Rocky Mountain junipers occur. And you say, what is characteristic of a Rocky Mountain juniper deadwood? Definitely, definitively, iconically sandblasted. Fine exposure of grains eroded from that heavy, incessant, nonstop wind that blows trucks over. I saw it happen. So when you start to think about that, and we're creating these different things, with Sierra juniper, we're talking about snow crush. Snow load, breaking, bending, and you're seeing how flexible they are. You're seeing almost that stringiness to the, when I tried to create this deadwood, and it would not break. It wouldn't crack, it wouldn't break, it just simply bent, right? These are all characteristics that when you guys start creating trees that are representative of those environments, and you're dealing with these individual species, these are opportunities. They don't have to be followed, but if we want to really maximize the diversity of our native species, if you were in the, in the uh, critique of the show this morning, uh, we talked about it with Abies, but these, these consistent aesthetics that play a role in and contribute to the uniqueness. And then we've talked about in this demonstration really picking where in the timeline of that tree's existence over the evolution of its life that design is going to represent you're starting to create an expansive depth to bonsai in our ability to design that we've never had before, right? Because it started as first branch, second branch, back branch. This was the beginning of bonsai in the, in the United States, right? One, two, back. One, two, back. This is orthodox, right? Still very quality in design. If you can execute it well, it's very difficult, okay? And then we started talking about Juniper. How do you design a juniper? How do you design a pine? And now we're talking about how do you design a black pine and a red pine and a white pine and a ponderosa pine. And now we're talking about what is the deadwood of a Sierra versus a Western versus a Rocky and the elements and the climates. And now we're talking about inside of those, we've got a variety of growth habits and we've also got this age that they can start to represent. And what ends up happening is you recognize <laughs> bonsai, you can do anything. Okay, this is more along the feel, the vibe that I want. How long has it taken me to tease that out? An hour? 45 minutes? 45. I don't have to work at it anymore. I've got it, right? I'm very, very happy with that. Very happy with the, the nuance. I'm very happy with the structural movements. I feel like they're congruent with the rest of the movement, particularly these undulations and these sharp angle changes through here, the way that this comes and rolls and folds, the way that this drops sort of undulates, not identical movement, different shifts and changes in direction, but nuance. So following that thematic structurally, and then really starting to try in as much as we can give direction. And you can see how much this growth tip, this is the perfect discussion, these pieces of the necking down of that element that it's influencing the design. You see how much direction you have by that growth tip? Now, typically, we would cut that growth tip, everything would grow, and we'd create this fan-shaped pad. But what we're saying, if we're going to really pull on that environmental influence, we're going to continue to work with that aesthetic. Okay? 
Now that I've got it, this is what applies to everything else on the tree. I like this. This feels, this feels compatible with the material. All right, I'm going to keep rocking. Any area where you guys, should I kind of move over here? Should we see what this looks like? Yeah? No? Does it really matter? Do you care where I go next? <laughs> huh? My house. <laughs> With, if you have a machine to carry this thing, I mean, seriously, this morning, this morning was a herniator getting this in the truck. This one? All right, let's go here. This one? Oh, this one. See how we handled it? I like it. I like your style. All right, let's do this one. Cool. Let's see how we're going to handle this billowy apical region. Is that kind of where you're curious? Cool. All right, here we go. Blasting off. Have any of you guys ever considered going to Europe and seeing a European exhibition? Anybody? Yeah? It's different. Very, very different. Different experience. You get, this, you get this melting pot of cultures when you get a European-wide exhibition. You have the Spaniards, and they've got this beautiful, really flamenco-like quality beauty to their bonsai. And then you have the Italian bonsai, which is really big trunks and really tiny foliage mass. And it's definitively a, a, a display. Uh, of masculinity, and, you, and you've got the French, which their, their trees are beautiful and very artistic and a little bit, you know, a little bit rugged, a little bit more rugged. It's the, the, the touches. The UK, it's very, very tight, very dialed in ramification, extremely technically well executed. And you see inside of each of these trees, one next to the other in Europe, you see each culture represented in the, in the technique. You see the influence of the culture on the individual. They don't even know it, you know, and it's what makes it so dynamic. It's amazing. If you guys can, go to the trophy in, in Belgium. It's in February, I believe. I think so. I'll be there uh, this coming year, uh, 2019. I'll be there. Uh, and Todd Schlafer is going to assist me on stage. I didn't offend any Italians in here today. No. Hey, Ryan, when you're working on a tree that doesn't have an audience and you're just working systematically through it, would you, where would you go next? Knowing that that first branch was the most important branch, where would you, would you just kind of work yourself around, or would you work to the branches you're working on now? Um, yeah, I, I would probably work along the same level, because I would never want to jump up into any, I, you have to build to that, right? Because each branch informs the other. Um, that's a really good question. I would, I would work along the same level, but I would go to the next area of curiosity of how I'm going to execute this, because... Ultimately, if you've got design sort of questions or you've got, you've got design decisions that have to be made, you need to answer one after the other almost systematically uh, to be able to construct sort of the totality. It's almost like building a home, you know, like I got to put this header in here and I've got to do this here in order to understand, you know, and I've kind of got to do, oh, this looks good. I'm going to do you know, It's like that. It's like a, it's a true building process. Um, I have a big question about how tight this needs to be with the length of that. This is probably where I would have gone next to understand this width dynamic, right? But I like this here because we'll knock out this whole front section and you guys will understand the aesthetic of the billowy nature of this tree, particularly with the transformation of this. So I'm, I'm, I think this is a great suggestion just to be able to carry the demonstration through. And this will be sort of the final piece that I'll get done uh, today. But I will, again, I'll follow up with a finality of the work. You know, and I talk, I talk to you guys about, and I brought up the idea about that process. Um, and in, in Japan, you know, when you're, wiring, when you're wiring a tree in Mr. Kimura's, 
the, the same process, the same cleaning, and then the identification of design and then structure, and then the, the really teasing out of, of a lot of these elements. It, 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 was, it was tree after tree after tree after tree, but even inside of consistency of all of these things, you know, it's just like in the critique this morning, I was talking to you guys about the fact that there are a lot of Japanese bonsai artists that go very far afield from the traditional model and from sort of the supported aesthetic in, in Japan. And you're starting to see more of that in the Kokfu exhibition. For example, you know, and these are the subtle nuances you guys have to, have to be aware of. Bonsai is a nuance, it's a subtle art form. Uh, particularly when we look at the, the, the Japanese approach to it. It's very small subtleties that, that separate one artist from another now. But the, the fact that when I was an apprentice uh, with Mr. Kimura, there was virtually no possibility of getting a literati tree or a Bunjin style tree into the Kokufu exhibition, right? And, and, and Michael Hagedorn, at a very early stage uh, of, of my apprenticeship, I remember it was either in an, it was an interview, I believe. Somebody interviewed him because he was kind of nearing the end of his apprenticeship as I was in, in the beginning of mine. And, uh, and he said, um, you know, if there's one thing he would like to see more of, it, it, it would be more feminine and sort of less big, bold trees in the Kokfu because, um, you know, it's a lot of steak and potatoes, I believe, was his, was his commentary and sometimes you want a salad. It's, it's a very aggressive, very, very um, heavy, dense show. And you're starting to see a lot more, you're starting to see a lot more cerebral, uh, delicate trees being exhibited in the Kokfu exhibition. And you're starting to see a lot more sort of artistic, nuanced, uh, freer forms in the Kokfu, which is, which is new. This is a, a moder modernization. So it's those, those nuances exist those, those minimal nuances exist throughout bonsai, and it, and it, starts to become, uh, it starts to become informative to how we can view each, each stage and portion of the process. And again, process being the point where I think the value exists now at this point. So when we talk about this consistency of, of being able to follow this process, it's not as rigid as it always has to be but it's always also that home that we can come back to. Just the same as in design, we can always come back to traditional design. We can always come back to the very basis of our process if we get lost exploring a potential for a different process to occur. And that's a real relief because you always have a backbone. And, and again, that's where having that firm footing of that allows us to deviate and really see if there's something else that can work better. And if it doesn't, we always go back. Okay, so now as I'm working through these pads, I've got this in my head. I've got, the, I've got that feeling of what those branches are. I've got, that, I've got that movement. I understand the drama of that structure. And I understand the drawing out of the length, okay? And I wanna, I wanna, be, I wanna stay true to that. Okay, so as I'm organizing this, I'm constantly sort of, I've got this in the back of my head because again, I said, I've already explored, I did the exploration, that took a lot of time, now I can just rock. So it's guiding me in terms of when I form this branch, really pushing, whereas I could expand this and make this a very big, you see how I can make that a very big bonsai pad, right? I'll show you guys in the detail cam. I could expand and make this a very wide bonsai pad, but if I want this to carry sort of that same reflection, if I wanted to carry that same reflection of that more neck down, wind impacted piece, I'm gonna create this much more dramatic, sort of pointed, directional. I'm gonna create that directional form. 
Okay, just to give it that movement, just to give it that, that, that shift and that consistency with the shape that exists over here. So I, I have that reference. Okay? I'm also going to neck down. I'm going I'm to close down the height of this. Notice how these are, are pretty sleek. I wanna, I'm going to slick that out. I want to make that a little bit, just a little bit more aerodynamic in terms of its form. Okay? And I can even shift just so I maintain, you know, in terms of this structure, just so I maintain that direction and that consistency of really sort of pinnacling out right at that point. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to reduce this so that it's not impacting that. And maybe even this needs to have a little bit more of a shift over to here. I feel like that domesticated it a little bit. Something in there, OK? You see that, that sleekness. So this is carrying that thematic all the way through. You got about 10 minutes, Ryan. 10 minutes? Yeah. OK. So I have a, a favorite exercise for demonstrations that I'm going to do with you guys. Um, but I'm going to prepare you for it, because this is important. Because when I put people on the spot, they really freak out. Um, before we go, I want each of you to lock into one thing that's been discussed here that you feel like you're going to take home and apply to your bonsai practice. Because if you're just here to be entertained, I did a shitty job. Okay, But if you're here to learn something, we talked about things that nobody discusses in demonstrations today. It's very, uh, very, very cerebral concepts about bonsai. So uh, I'm going to call out to the crowd. I'm going to point at people, and I'm going to ask you what you learned. And I'm going to give you guys 10 minutes to decide what it is you're going to tell me if you're that person. What you learned that you're going to take home and apply to your bonsai practice, having, having spent the past uh, three and a half hours with me just literally bearing my soul about bonsai to you guys. So <laughs> you got to take something. And if anybody wants to proactively volunteer that information, please, by all means, go ahead. Kendall, Ryan, did you learn anything? I mean, I already knew Occidentalis Occidentalis. What okay. was the other one? Occidentalis Australis. That's the one. That's I the one. That. That's the one. Very practical, very nuts and bolts. <laughs> Sam? I'm going to be that person. I'm so new to all of this. Um, but I've, uh, yeah, no, I, I'm just kind of absorbing all of this. I don't okay. have a specific take home yet. Mm. I think once I have my own tree, then I'll be able to buy <laughs> some of this. So Sam and Ryan are the newest members of the of the Mariah Live team. I had to I had to pick on them in a very public forum today. Actually, I'll I'll add one more thing. One thing I did learn is is to not lie like, uh, lie as heavily on the the sort of fan shaped pads. Ah, okay. Howard, did you learn anything today? You knew that was coming. Uh, I'll do it without the microphone. Okay. I always learn something new. <laughs> Just to pick one example, I uh, sort of focused on something you did early on, which is selecting parts at the top, major branches at the top, based on their relationship to the live vein as the live vein sort of balances the top. Killer. Killer. That's, that's a big one. That's a big one. I was inspired by your talking to your tree and sensing from it. And, I, and I've tried somewhat to do that in the past, but, but that's going to inspire me to, to put more energy into it to, to really feel from them what they want. Yeah. And, and Cool. Realize they, they can do that. Cool. And, and one request, too, before you finish, will you be able to give us a three-year 
plan for what you're going to do, when you're going to repot it, what kind of pot, um, so on. And you bet. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Absolutely. Wow, that's, that, that's a good one. I know from my personal experience of like trying to see which branch to set first, it was nice to have that book binding aspect where you could just change the set. Ah, okay. First time. No, um... <laughs> it was nice to have that defining aspect of the approach to set the branch that sets the whole tree. Right. First. Really, really set the tone and the design and the style. Yeah. yeah. And then the domestication and non-domestication. Right, 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 right. That was a big one for me. All of it is tools, right? All of these are tools. You guys, you guys don't... You, you can go to the movie to be entertained. Uh, we're all passionate about bonsai. This, this, for me, is not about entertaining you with the finished product and everybody going, wow, that's amazing, because you can see that in every other demonstration that you watch, too. So, tools. We're using this to educate you guys. I said I wasn't going to do anything I wouldn't do in my own workshop, uh, but I have, because I've sat here and talked to you about all of the tools. So what really... Okay, we're on. Okay. Uh, what uh, I really appreciated was the different framing you put around the big movements happening in the tree with the primary branches and then the smaller movement happening in the more juvenile foliage. Right. To, and I, I, I do it that way, but I hadn't seen it as a matter of age. And I like, I like seeing it that way. Yeah. Yeah, sort of bearing the, bearing the, the scars or the scarlessness of, of youth versus more aged branches carrying forward that indicator of time. Yeah, and there's one thing we didn't talk about in terms of junipers, but also, you know, with this interaction of live and dead, the live vein interacting with the dead, really getting to see the movement of that live vein, really old, rugged, exposed dead wood, and it gets progressively smoother as you get close to the live vein. You know, and there's a really good indication of that right here where you've got the oldest in the middle here, and you can see it getting progressively smoother as it gets towards the living vein. This too carries forward the story, right, of the movement of this interaction that gives junipers value, and that same transition from this to this to this to this, you see a smoothing out of that line, right? And so we get these timelines of this tree's existence over the course of it. Yeah, very, very cool, yeah. So, Ryan, <clears throat> the thing I get to take away for all of my trees is that transpiration is the vehicle of oxen. Yes. From the bottom of the roots to the tip of the Yes, tips. yes. That's awesome. That's awesome. Is it not the most perfect mechanism that you've ever seen for this very pivotal discussion of how this tree allocates its resources. I mean, it's the intelligence of the tree is, and I had a big argument with Rob about this on the drive from <laughs> Portland to New York, where we talked about the human beings creating technology and this being a significant state of intelligence. And I said, I don't know if it's intelligent how much we're destructive to the environment that we depend on to live in. Maybe it's these other living beings. And he said there's a time in history where trees were consuming so much of the CO2 that they were actually massive and they were going to outgrow the carbon dioxide supply. And then I said, well, then if they, if they did that, the trees that needed the least amount of carbon dioxide would survive and the rest would die off. And this is the ebb and flow of sort of pr predator-prey model, right? Wolves, rabbits, rabbits, wolves and you get this sort of arc to the, to the way that things exist when it's naturally guided. Um, but it's, it's interesting, very interesting, the mechanism that exists inside of the natural system. And I'm not saying, and I'm, I'm not saying humans are stupid, I just, there's different forms in, of intelligence. Anybody else learn anything? Scott, what'd you learn? Hold on, Scott. You just reinforced many, many of the things that you talk about on Mariah that I've learned over the last 18 months. Uh, what I found most interesting was just the reinforcing of the drive to let the material 
and our culture and our environment drive what the uh, design of a tree is going to be and how to best uh, insinuate that or carry that off. Cool, cool, nice, nice. Kind of building off that, I think what I picked up most is uh, the, the elements of, con of continuity of design, of, from that being the foliage on the pads to the dead wood, to keep using that to unify the whole design and carrying right. that element through and repeating that through. Nice. Something that my trees could benefit more from. Nice, nice, awesome, awesome. Yeah, and if you guys want to see, you know, uh, uh, and um, we'll have the critique. We recorded the critique this morning. The critique that I did this morning will be on Mirai Live, but the show, this show, this exhibition, there's such a depth to this exhibition. It's, it's, its depth gave me the ability to discuss things I've never discussed in a critique, and you'll want to check that out if you want to hear more about that. Um, but when you walk through this exhibition, there's so many reflections of the things that are illustrated here in this raw styling in a real showable finished form, mainly when you look at the subalpine firs in there, when you look at the crown of the Japanese black pine, when you look at the ramification of the Tsukomo cypress, when you look at the intricate delicacies of Dennis Voitia's Japanese maple, there's a lot of really high level design considerations specific to the species and executed to perfection in this exhibition. Really be intentional about your observations when you walk through that. It's small, it's very intimate, but it's of a very, very high caliber for the quality of tree that we're seeing in such a small space and intentional in the number of trees and the level that they're at in that exhibition. I'm, I'm overly, overly impressed with that and what is capable of being learned from that exhibition. Did not disappoint. The Pacific Northwest did not disappoint. Okay, let me, wrap up, let me wrap up this little section. I'm not gonna get through the apex and I know that there's other uh, things that have to happen. I might just kind of stay. I'll free you guys of, of the, uh, the Mirai vacuum for a little while and just kind of stay and knock out this region of the tree so you can see stylistically where it's headed. Um, and then I've got a workshop this afternoon. Who's in my workshop this afternoon? Cool. I've been growing those trees for a very long time, so good on you guys. Any last questions before we wrap this up? Are we about at the end of time? Aftercare, aftercare. Oh, container, three to five. Yeah, who asked that? That was, yeah, cool. Um, so container for this tree. Let's, uh, let's kind of dive in because this too starts to become a matter of, of question and discussion. So if we talk about, right, and, and you guys are going to be like, geez, I'm so tired of having to make decisions, okay? If we talk about standard approach, rectangle, rectangular container, Typically, when we would think about the depth, we would start with the width of the trunk. If you had a container that had that kind of depth, it would be that big. So we know that we wouldn't necessarily use that as a reference, because this is about as powerful of a Sierra as you're going to see in a, in a, in a container. Okay? Um, but a rectangle with sharp masculine features. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the edge of the container is literally like cut yourself sharp. It means that maybe the walls are very, very straight or slightly angled, but we get that big, massive, visual, bulky feel to be able to anchor sort of the feeling of this tree, which is raw power, okay? That would be the standard model. This was where we would go if we were saying, okay, as a bonsai, from the convention of bonsai, this is how the convention of bonsai would be executed in a container selection. Very raw earthen tone, probably shifting either towards the reddish hue to make the tree just explode, particularly with this bluish foliage, right? If you went towards the gray, it would become much more quiet, okay? And we talked about that uh, in, in terms of the critique and we sort of touched on clay color up here a couple times, okay? If you wanted to move more towards the organic, okay, if you wanted to move more towards insinuation of the natural environment, this is where we start to say, okay, stone, slab, and these elements are great, but we've also got to ask, we've got to say there's a form and a function, okay, there's an aesthetic and a functionality to the container. If we put this on a slab, can you keep a Sierra juniper hydrated enough? Sierra junipers, as far as junipers are concerned, concern, use more water than any other juniper species in the world that I've worked with to date. 
They are a high alpine, heavy snow load, consistent moisture, organic components in the medium, right? And they love that water. So when you put it on a situation where it doesn't have that reservoir, I don't know that it's going to thrive, okay? Having said that, if you can create some sort of organic vessel that does have the depth to hold the moisture, if it's a deeper stone and you've got a forklift to move this tree, right? That would be far more impactful with the way and the direction that we're moving with the design. If we want to, to have that reservoir and we don't want to have that implication, now finding a ceramicist that can add some of those organic aesthetics, textures, colors, shapes, and informality seems like the direction we could move to have the best of both worlds, and that's probably the direction that I would like to go with this tree, is striking that balance, knowing what Sierra's need, knowing the form that I would like, and trying to mix and match both of those pieces. Three to five years, there's absolutely an exorbitantly larger amount of number of branches on this tree than will exist in this tree's really refined form. Refined form, we're probably gonna see in five to seven years, okay? but it's gonna be showable in three to five years, and it will continue to evolve once it becomes showable in terms of its level of refinement. But when we talk about tapping into that ancient form, negative space and remnants of what were are what create that ancient form and that more older aesthetic. So as this evolves, the areas that I want to keep, they're gonna get denser and more refined. I'm gonna pull out the areas in between them, leave behind Deadwood as a representation of what was, open up the space with the removal of that piece, and really just keep this moving forward until the areas I want are developed and the areas I don't want are represented with remnants, okay? There will come a point where this gets to that seven, eight, 10 year mark, and all of a sudden, it's gonna be like, well, this doesn't even look like the tree that I had conceptualized and tried to represent. And this comes to that point where we get to carry that aesthetic from the 200-year-old to the 500-year-old, or the 500-year-old to the 1,000-year-old, or the 1,000-year-old to the 3,000-year-old, where we elevate the aesthetic to that next iteration of that tree's life cycle and that tree's position sort of in the natural environment. And that, that comes back to a whole new level of conceptualization. All right, Ryan, we got time for one more question. Cool. Ira, you're the last one, so make Pressure. it really good. Really great question. <laughs> um, could you talk about some of the nuance for how you might handle the dead wood in relationship to a more natural design versus a, a bonsai, quote unquote? Yeah, yeah, interesting, really forward. interesting question. Okay, so if there is a discussion of how would we handle the dead wood in terms of if we wanted to expand on, or typically when we say I'm going to put a power tool, I'm going to put any, I'm going to put something on this dead wood. I'm going to, I'm going to consciously deface the aged deadwood for a reason. It would generally be to reduce visual mass. And if we start to talk about reducing visual mass, for a Sierra juniper that's so bulky in particular, the reduction of visual mass is a very real technique that we can approach to improve the quality of the deadwood. And I'm not saying that's true with this tree, but if we were going to improve it at all, reduction of visual mass would be the way we would go. In order to reduce visual mass, the characteristic of Sierra juniper rotting from the inside out and hollows being a part of that makes it very, very easy to do so. But our focus in terms of handling of deadwood if we artificially create it is to have a foreground and a background and let shadow play on that. So any way that I penetrated into this deadwood, I would do so at an angle from the front where you're viewing. So light catches the foreground and casts a shadow on the background. And this would be how we would handle deadwood to add more depth. Now, I think Ira's question is different, right? Do we, do we preserve this with lime sulfur? Do we continue to let this be very stark in contrast and clean the bark? Do we let this gray out? Do we let this silver out? And do we lose that when we start talking about natural versus a more, um, say, manicured, artificial aesthetic. And I'm gonna say that I think there's a lot of value in allowing deadwood to gray out, in allowing lime sulfur to disappear off of the deadwood, in allowing the natural hues and tones of the deadwood to be a bigger part of the composition. And I think there is a strong aesthetic value to showing that contrast, to using this more as a living piece of sculpture where you're ab executing abstracted design concepts. You show the red, you show the white, you contrast it with the blue. It's maybe the most powerful color combination in bonsai as a sculptural element, the Sierra Juniper, okay? And the beauty of it is when we handle the deadwood and when we handle the live vein, it's only so short-lived. Again, the process is the value, the product is momentary. 
So creating that contrast, it's going to age again. It's going to silver out. It's going to gray out. It's going to gray up. It's going to decrease contrast. And that's the beauty of getting to have all of your cake and eat it too with bonsai is you're always going to lose the artificiality. You can always add that design element. You can always move back towards the organic. If you guys wanted to, never put a single preservative on this deadwood. And I'm just telling you right now, this has never been touched with lime sulfur. Uh, this is entirely natural. The sheen of white, this is very, very uh, iconic and representative of Sierra junipers in the high alpine because of the intense ultraviolet that bleaches out the deadwood. But if I were going to try and represent this as more organic hues come out, some of the caramels, some of the reds, some of the peaches, then you can use a wood hardener that preserves the wood, that protects the wood, that fills the pores, prevents some of that rot from happening, but also maintains the original color. And that's now become sort of those two options, wood hardener to maintain the natural or lime sulfur to give it the contrast. And these are those, those tandems. And so on Mirai Live, we've talked about what kind of wood hardener, how to apply it. We've talked about lime sulfur, how to handle it. You guys have the information that we've never had before. Okay, all right. Uh, this was a, a big risk today doing a tree of this on stage demonstration at an event this size. And um, I appreciate you guys participating in the experiment. It'll be available on Mirai Live for free for all of you guys to check out. Very interesting conversation, very productive in terms of, I think, what we were able to tease out and learn about bonsai. Uh, and truly a pleasure to be here with you guys. Thank you. Have a great weekend.